And welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to the beautiful Globe of Science and Innovation at uh, CERN. Welcome also to those who are watching uh, us uh, online. Second edition of Sparks, the Serendipity Forum at uh, CERN. And Bruno Giussani is going to be your guide through the two sessions of uh, the day. What we just saw is an animation created by the creatives at uh, Studio Ouch. And what they did is they took data from uh, the Human Cell Atlas. You're going to hear about it later in the event, uh, especially RNA sequencing data. They fed it into a machine learning system, uh, gave some instructions, and that's what uh, came out, an attempt at describing visually some of the things that we want to talk about uh, today. It's very fitting uh, because we're going to talk about data, about big data, about sharing data, about artificial intelligence and many other things during the course of the next uh, three hours and a half. So last year we had the first edition of Sparks. It was about future intelligence. We focused a lot on artificial intelligence. This year the focus is on future technologies for health. We're going to, trap to try to map some of them, try to understand and discuss what they are, what's their potential, what are their possible impacts, not only medical, but also social and uh, ethical, and how do we make them accessible to all. Sparks is actually an initiative in three parts. This is the public conference. Tomorrow there's going to be a private event uh, with experts, 50 experts, it's a forum, 50 experts discussing some of the topics of uh, uh, today. And the third part is already public, is a podcast that uh, we published about two weeks ago. Uh, that one, the CERN Sparks podcast, is the second season. Six episodes, 14 interviews uh, with experts from all over the world, all connected, of course, to uh, health and health tech. Among the guests was, for example, George Church. Uh, he's widely considered one of the founding fathers of uh, genomics. And one of the things he told me during our interview it, uh, is that he believes that there is a way to edit DNA so that every form of life, but especially us human, can become resistant to all pathogenic viruses. And that was not the only wow moment during that podcast. There are many of them. Another of the guests was Jennifer Doudna, uh, who got the Nobel Prize uh, for chemistry a couple of years ago for COVID discovering the gene editing technology CRISPR 10 years ago. And the discussion with her was about what happens when you take CRISPR and artificial intelligence and put them together. And there, a new field of possibility opens up. So you can find the Sparks podcast, all the six episodes already published on all the typical uh, streaming platforms, uh, Google, Apple, Spotify, uh, etc., uh, for downloading and for listening. Now, uh, just a couple of final points of logistics and practical things before we start. Uh, we are streaming this event, and so for you here in the room, it means that you may be on camera at some point because the cameras are filming from different angles. Just be aware of that. Uh, but also, people watching don't necessarily want to hear our phones ringing or their screen popping up alive in the middle of the theater, so please keep them away and uh, off. Uh, should there be an emergency, you just follow the ramp and uh, we can all go downstairs. And for those who are watching us online, of course, you can multitask, which we cannot do here, so you can also engage on the certain social media channels. Finally, uh, health and safety. If you wish to wear a mask, it's not mandatory, it's to your discretion, but if you wish to wear a mask, you certainly uh, can here in the uh, theater. So let's dive in. We have two sessions, and we have tried to have an organizing principles for the sessions. The first one, roughly <laughs> is about keeping treating people when they're sick and the second one is about keeping them healthy before they get uh, sick that's a little bit uh, the line that we're gonna try to follow and we're gonna start with uh, uh, what has happened over the last couple of years uh, a global scale health emergency which was also a global scale health experiment in a way, uh, the COVID pandemic. We have not managed to uh, push it behind us yet completely, but we've learned a lot of things during those two years. And so to talk a little bit about that and about other aspects of global health, I'm really glad to invite as the opening speaker, the chief scientist of the World Health Organization, Dr. Somia Swaminathan. Please, the stage is yours.
Thank you so much, Bruno. I think that was a great uh, introduction. And uh, I'm not going to talk about COVID. I think we've all been hearing far too much about it over the last couple of years, and we, we want to move on. However, there are many lessons from COVID and many things that we've done, especially the way science has advanced. We're going to hear more about mRNA and things like that. But what I would like to do today is to talk a little bit about something that's close uh, to your hearts, I'm sure, and that's about data and digital tools and how we use that to deal with uh, health emergencies. Now, if you look at uh, this visualization of, um, of a health problem, which is in this case, maternal and neonatal mortality, then we can see that um, we're very far away from the SDGs and that's just one of the indicators. We're actually going backwards on many of the SDG health indicators and therefore we, business as usual isn't going to be good enough We've got to learn to do things more efficiently, faster, and um, and also more collaboratively, as we did show was possible during COVID. Again, you'll be familiar with uh, with this, the mobile phone revolution, starting from 2000, and this visualization basically shows um, how Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, you know, the mobile phone penetration is out of proportion to the uh, even the large populations that live there. And therefore, this actually provides us an opportunity to, to do things differently. So at the WHO, we've been um, really thinking about the digital transformation of health systems for some time now and moving our guidelines, our recommendations, our norms and standards onto platforms that are much more user-friendly that are uh, you know, timely and, and that can deliver to people the information they need uh, at the click of a, of a button. And, and while Google is great, uh, it's not necessarily uh, always providing the right information. And so this is something we're working with the tech partners, with um, not just Google, but many of our, the big technology companies to see how can we actually uh, um, make it possible for people to, to see um, credible and, and good, solid, evidence-based information when they're searching for something. Um, and, and one of the, our activities which is going to accelerate now is really taking all of our guidelines uh, and converting them into, through these digital implementation guides, helping countries, developing the standards so that these become interoperable, that they can be used with open source uh, software standards across the world. And then we'll also enable the data that comes in uh, to be uh, to be shared in much easier ways than is possible today. And, and these are just some of the examples of, of some of the products over the last few years. We've had a program called Be Healthy, Be Mobile. You mentioned the second part of today is going to talk about keeping people healthy. This was a collaboration with ITU, basically just using mobile phones and SMSs to um, provide people um, uh, messaging on, on tobacco cessation, for example, or on diabetes, self-management, on hypertension. And it's been quite, uh, quite successful and something that could be scaled up. The other good uh, example is the, is the COVID vaccination uh, certificate, which, as you know, all of us need to show when we travel. And if we did it in the old ways in which each country provided it on a different type of a platform, then it would not be recognizable by the country. So this was one of the first things countries asked us to do is to provide the standards so that uh, a computable form of the, of the uh, certificate could be widely used. And building on that, we're going to go further. So I was talking about guidelines and, and the way that WHO normally does guidelines in the past has been that you know they're updated every once, every few years, because it's a lot of work to to do the systematic reviews, to, to make the changes, to then publish it. Then these, of course, have to be adopted and implemented by countries. But again, COVID accelerated our, uh, our uh, movement to something we call the living approach to guidelines, where artificial intelligence is actually working in the background, screening literature and, um, and um, triggering when a recommendation should change and telling us there have been three new large studies you know, on the use of this drug for the treatment of this disease, let's say dementia, I think you need to look at your guideline and then it goes into this living systematic review process and, and it's easy if it's on a digital platform to update 
the recommendations in a much more timely fashion. And so this then brings the latest uh, information based on solid research and evidence to healthcare providers, doctors, nurses uh, around the world, because our primary audience are healthcare providers, though WHO is now getting into also talking directly with the public. And again, that's something we started during COVID, but we realized that there's a value to WHO speaking directly to people about how they, what other things they can do to have better health. So again, you know, collecting data uh, and data sharing is, is going to be critical in the days to come. And I think we have to solve some fundamental problems on how we do that. I'm delighted that we're actually working with CERN uh, to look at how we handle research data that, you know, there's loads of it around the world that's not really most efficiently being used today. But then you need analytics, you need people who are trained to analyze and look at data uh, and especially large data sets. And then the actionable insights that come from this data is very important. And again, we need people who are trained in looking at, uh, at data and being able to, to um, have these, uh, uh, these insights that then will inform action. And we saw during COVID again, the huge variability between countries in how they used evidence and how they used that to make policy. And, and the best, uh, I think the countries that did the best were those that actually had a multidisciplinary team looking at data and constantly updating their guidance and also were, be, were quite humble about the fact that they needed to change and communicate it better. So one of the new things that's been set up um, about a year ago is the hub in Berlin. It's called the, the WHO Global Hub for Epidemics and Pandemics. And, and, and they will now host this international pathogen surveillance network. We've seen genomic sequencing capacity expand many fold across the world, when today even the average person on the street can talk about variants and sequences and, and RNA and DNA and things they hadn't heard of before. And so this kind of network will hopefully for the future build a trusted network of, of partners around the world who will share data, who will you know build capacity. Again, you look at this map, you'll see that Africa is generally underrepresented in, in, in these kind of um, capacities, but they given an opportunity, will catch up very, very fast. We have also normative, our normative role, so coming out with policies. This one, for example, on the reuse of health data for research, and as I mentioned, we're working with CERN to set up a metadata repository based on the Zenodo platform that, uh, that CERN has, has used in order to make the secondary use of data possible for researchers and to, and to um, encourage more international collaborations in health research and be able to use things like artificial intelligence, which you can only do when you have very large heterogeneous uh, data sets. We also recently came out with the guiding principles for pathogen genome data sharing. These have just been published on our website. And uh, this was uh, done actually over years of, of, uh, of discussions uh, uh, with groups around the world because there's a lot of uh, sensitivity around data sharing, but also around the equity aspects of the benefit sharing. And there are many questions raised about, yes, you want us to share data, but how about the benefits? How do they get shared? And we saw what happened with, with vaccines, uh, but also with diagnostics and so on. So I think equity now today is very much the center of uh, discussion uh, globally. Technology has changed the way that information is produced, distributed, and, and consumed. And one of the early quotes from Dr. Tedros uh, in February of 2020 was when he said, we're not just fighting an, an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. And we've seen today how fake news spreads so quickly, especially through uh, social media channels. So I think as scientists, all of us need to think very seriously about this issue of the trust in science, and uh, which if, goes the wrong way, it can really have very negative consequences as we are seeing with the anti-vaccine groups, really spreading a lot of doubt among people and today having an impact, even reaching out to the developing countries in Africa, for example, and sowing doubts about childhood vaccines. And you can imagine what is likely to happen with diseases like measles and, and diphtheria and polio that we had a good handle on thanks to good vaccines all of this can be lost very quickly if this uh, trust is, is eroded. And so it's not just trust in science, but
trust between people in, in a society and trust between people and the government. And this slide basically shows uh, um, studies that have been recently published showing that vaccine coverage, for example, is, is uh, linearly correlated with, uh, with trust in government. And on the other hand, uh, corrupt government was inversely correlated with vaccine coverage. And I have heard many anecdotes from many countries uh, actually corroborating the fact that where people do not trust their government and, and there weren't credible sources of information, vaccine coverage actually has been extremely low despite the availability of vaccines. So we're going to hear a lot about new technologies. So I'm not going to go into the details, but clearly we're think talking about things like digital inoculation. How do we address this uh, fake news and, and uh, anti-science? We're thinking about an infodemics tech cell. Of course, AI is going to play a big role in medicine in the future. So we're focusing again on developing regulatory uh, and ethical framework so that countries or, in, or institutions that are going to implement AI-based solutions for health uh, have a framework uh, of ethics with which they can work. And of course, we we'll need to look more and more at, uh, at how to use these emerging technologies, uh, as you said, Bruno, to really help people live healthier lifestyles. And we already have this, uh, this a chatbot with Florence, you can see on the screen there, who will answer questions on things like tobacco use uh, or COVID vaccines or, or mental health. And so we want to really build and expand on, uh, on, uh, on these technologies, but do them in a way, again, that is, uh, that is based on science and evidence that is updated frequently, but that's also accessible. Because when we think about these uh, cutting edge technologies, I think the fact is that still there are large parts of the world where people don't have access either to traditional uh, healthcare uh, and certainly they may get left behind. So again, I just I want to end with this, I think, very wise quote from Stephen Hawking, where he says a future is a race between the growing power of technology and the wisdom with which we use it. Thank you very much. Bruno. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Samia. With the next speaker, we're going to look at one of the leading causes of death in the world, cancer. It takes about 10 million lives every year. It's of course not an upbeat story to tell, but there is an upbeat angle to it, and it's about uh, new ways to uh, confront cancer. Bruce Levine is one of the pioneers of a cancer treatment called CAR T cell therapy, uh, which was, by the way, the first gene therapy approved by the FDA in the United States. He's a professor of uh, cancer gene therapy at the University of Pennsylvania. Please welcome Bruce Levine. Thank you very much. These are the pioneers, Emily on the left and Bill on the right. In these pictures, they're dying. They're dying of cancer. They have relapsed. There's no available treatment to them. How do they survive? What if you had leukemia and I could take your cells, bring them to a clean room laboratory and modify them genetically to train them to recognize cancer and to kill cancer and then I give those cells back to you? Well, I'm going to tell you about that story. Well, cancer as you may know, is derived from our own cells, our own cells that don't stop dividing. Now, the problem in the immune system recognizing cancer is the immune system evolved to tell self from non-self, and if cancer is derived from yourself, that's a problem. And so those immune cells that recognize cancer are very, very rare. Uh, and if they're present, it's not only like looking for a needle in a haystack, it's like finding a dull needle in that haystack. So how do we design and train T cells to hunt cancer? Well, you may know that the chimera is a mythical beast with the body of a lion, the head of a goat, and the tail of a serpent. In our case, we're using a molecular chimera composed of immune receptors, antibodies on the outside to recognize tumor antigens. On the inside, we have signaling domains to deliver that recognition signal. Now we need a Trojan horse, uh, and we need a Trojan horse to deliver that genetic material to the cell. We're using HIV, a disabled form of HIV that cannot cause disease. Its only role is to deliver 
RNA that is reverse transcribed into DNA that is permanently integrated into the genome. And so here's how that works. We use the lentiviral vector, the HIV. It delivers that RNA, reverse transcribed into DNA, permanently integrated into the genome. And now the T cell retains its native T cell receptor, but it also expresses this chimeric antigen receptor, or this CAR, that can now recognize the tumor antigen and kill the tumor cell. So what does that look like under the microscope? Here we have colored tumor cells green. The CAR T cell is in the bottom left. Uh, and what you're going to see over the course of eight seconds is recognition, activation, the secretion of enzymes that will poke holes in the membrane of the tumor cell, causing it to explode. Here we have the recognition, activation, and now you see that tumor cell explode. This CAR T cell is a living drug. The daughter cells will go to recognize more cancer cells, and the granddaughter cells will go recognize more tumor cells. Now here's Bill in August 2010. Up top you see his bone marrow. Everything that is brown is leukemia. Six months later, his bone marrow is clear and he's leukemia free. In the first three adult patients with chronic lymphoid leukemia that we treated, between 1.3 and 3.5 kilograms of tumor were obliterated by their engineered CAR T cells. Now here's Bill a few years later and he's receiving some infusions and he has a t-shirt that one of the nurses was wearing that they gave out to celebrate the FDA approval of this therapy in August 2017. He's holding a note in his right hand. Note says, I was patient number one of CART-19 and all I got was this t-shirt <laughs> and remission. So he's a happy camper and with his wife traveled uh, the U.S. Uh, visiting national uh, parks. Now, Bill had chronic lymphoid leukemia, relatively slow growing. We wanted to ask the question, what if we move to acute lymphoid leukemia where basically it's doubling every day? And these patients who are relapsed or refractive really don't have time. Uh, they're falling off the edge of the earth. Would those CAR T cells be able to catch up? So here's Emily. She was diagnosed in May 2010, relapsed twice came to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, received a drug regimen that would kill an adult and only one third of kids make it through. She did make it through, but her bone marrow was still full of 60% leukemic blast. She had lesions in her kidney, liver, and spleen, and she was not far from her demise. Well, she recovered thanks to her own CAR T cells. And she was patient number one, uh, but she was certainly uh, not the last. Uh, we licensed this technology to Novartis, who conducted multi-center clinical trials worldwide uh, and matched the global biologistics of a gene-modified cell therapy, where the cells are collected in Australia collect and, and sent to New Jersey for manufacture and then shipped back. So that resulted in the FDA approval of this drug, Kimraya. This is a bag of cells, but it's a drug. We now have six approved CAR T cell therapies from various manufacturers to treat relapse refractory pediatric acute lymphoid leukemia, adult lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. And there will be more as time goes on. This is an accelerating uh, field. But we have wonderful clinical responses, uh, but not from everyone. We have approvals in blood cancers, we still have a lot of work to do on solid cancers, and we need to work on enhancing potency. So how can we teach every T cell all that it can be? Well, we are in the era of synthetic biology where, where we can design those receptors to function in a logic-gated fashion and or not, switches, conditional activation, safety switches, and potency enhancers. Now let's talk about access to new therapies because we have approvals in North America, in Europe, in Israel, in Australia, Japan. How do we get to more countries and how do we get to more patients? We need to work on potency, as I said, especially for solid tumors. 
This therapy is complex to manufacture. The lot size is one. It's unique to each individual. There's gene modification. We have a viral vector. Can we shorten that manufacturing, implement automation, or could we potentially generate these CAR T cells in the blood, perhaps with nanoparticles to deliver the genetic material? There's a talent shor shortage worldwide, and uh, we need education and training at all levels. And we need to recognize that these therapies in their first iteration are financially complex. Can we implement biomarkers to enhance our decision making and implement value-based payment systems? Now, worried about ethics, because with many new technologies, there are bad actors that piggyback on these terms. And this uh, is an article that appeared in Science Magazine some years ago talking about these strip mall stem cell clinics or stem cell clinics that market stem cells direct to consumer for everything for Alzheimer's to autism. Uh, and what really struck me in reading the story is the quote from the supposed patient, I don't know the science behind my miracle cure and I don't care. What message does that send about the scientific and clinical validation of the development of new therapies. Well, here's Emily 10 years later, leukemia free, an honor student, a senior in high school, driving, applying to colleges. Uh, and her parents have started a philanthropic foundation. It's a remarkable story how she was treated and sh she recovered. Uh, and it's so remarkable, it's the uh, subject of a full-length documentary film of Medicine and Miracles that premiered at the Tribeca Film Festi Festival this past June. And it's playing at festivals around the U.S., and I hope that distribution rights are in place so that you're able to view it internationally. Now, the Emily Whitehead Foundation has had gala events, uh, Believe Ball, this is in October, and they invited dozens of kids who have received this CAR T cell therapy. Imagine being on this stage and sharing the story of your treatment with someone that you never met who went through this unique treatment yourselves. These children would not be here were it not for that therapy. Well, it does truly really take a village to develop these transformative uh, therapies. This is a celebratory flash mob in the lobby of the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania, August 30th, 2017, um, recognizing uh, that hundreds of people participated in the development of this therapy. These are my disclosures. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. There is a game of where is Bruce in that last photo there, the flash mob. So before the next talk, we're going to take a beat, and I mean that literally, because we're going to take a look at a short animation showing how the blood flows through a healthy human heart. It has been created by the Fraunhofer Institute of Digital Medicine in Germany. Let's watch.
So there is quite some artistry there, but that's actually how blood really flows in a human heart. There are many developments in the field of uh, detection and of imaging uh, in the uh, space of health, and some are happening here at uh, CERN, and so we wanted to get uh, a glimpse on that. Uh, and for that, I would uh, like to invite on stage one of CERN's senior researchers. Please welcome Magdalena Kowalska. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to, to tell you about the developments that are happening at CERN and in collaborating institutes that are linked to medical applications. And I'll just start by reminding you, of course, what is the nature of the work that we are doing at CERN. Because at CERN, the idea is to do basic science. But basic science, it means that we take a blue sky thinking. We have ideas that we try to realize. We are allowed to take risks. That's very important. We are not, uh, we are not told uh, if we want to try new things. We want to go beyond state of the art. And that also means that uh, we have to collaborate. And more and more often, our collaborations are interdisciplinary. So that's why it's quite natural that actually this basic science approach goes out to the world. So now imagine what happens when such a basic science lab goes out to the doctor's office. And uh, here you can see we daily work with big detectors, big accelerators, and yet the doctors have very small devices in their places. And uh, our detectors, we want to make them pre more precise, more sensitive. At the same time, we are humans. Well, we care about the well-being of ourselves and of our families. So, of course, it's very natural that we think of what we do, how could we apply it to medicine, to treating patients, to better diagnosis. And this actually started, well, a long time ago. So, for example, my co-patriot, uh, Maria Skłodowska-Curie, who was also a nuclear physicist, I myself, she already started using alpha-emitting nuclei to cure cancer ba linked to her basic research. So in our case, we will try to do and go beyond what Maria Skłodowska was doing, maybe in an even safer uh, way. So when we go to the doctor's office, we realize very quickly that we actually have the same aims. We want to diagnose and treat diseases uh, with better efficiency, better. And for that, we need devices which are smaller, cheaper, and also techniques that are more precise and more sensitive. Yet, we also realize that we have different ideas how to reach these goals. And again, I'm showing you what we are used to, what we work with at CERN. We have big accelerators, we have big detectors, and we work with radiation. For example, in my laboratory where I work, which is called Isolde, we work daily with radioactive isotopes. And I actually, I'll have to tomorrow after the session, I'll have to run to my team because we have an experiment going on. So this is what we do. And uh, I can tell you for me, the easiest would be, well, I would have a dream that I would take a patient, I would bring them into Isolde, I would put them in front of the beam line where I produce terbium isotopes. And one of the terbium isotopes would diagnose the patient, the other one would cure it. Or alternatively, I would take that patient five meters further to my own setup. I would put them inside a refurbished MRI scanner, which flew to Isolde all the way from Australia, put them in the MRI scanner and give them radioactive xenon isotope, which, uh, which I'm, uh, I'm using for medical diagnosis. But I guess the patient and the doctor wouldn't appreciate that approach. So instead of bringing the patient to the lab, we have to think of how to bring the lab or bring the technology to the patient. And uh, once we realize that, there are really many advantages. There's a lot of interesting things happening. And I'll try to walk you through a, a few examples, which are sorted in the order of maturity, how close to the patient the technology is. And also, it's quite natural because, of course, at CERN, it's accelerators. So that's why the first thing we started doing is to apply accelerators in medicine. And what you see on the left is actually not a CERN lab. It's a real facility to treat patients with protons. It's at one of the dozen hadron therapy centers, which exist around the world by now, 
which are aimed at treating tumors with high energy protons. By now, we also use carbon isotopes to do it, or ca stable carbon, and there are even crazy ideas to use unstable carbon to do, uh, to do it. So these are still very large laboratories. And what you see to the right is a prototype of a smaller uh, facility, which would be using electrons. That one is called FLASH. The technology is called FLASH, and it actually comes from CERN activities of a compact linear collider. And the first facility of this uh, type will soon be built in Lausanne in Switzerland, not too far from Geneva. So this is what we can do when we use accelerators. Now we can think further, and of course we have detectors, our detectors, we want them to be sensitive, fast, uh, uh, with high resolution. So we can also use the same detectors, the same developments, to perform medical diagnosis. And what you see in this photo are crystals that are being developed by my colleagues uh, at CERN, which are used not only in the big CERN experiments, but also for future positron emission tomography devices. And actually, on a side note, this technique of diagnosis PET, positron emission tomography, was developed in the Geneva Hospital. And some of the technologies and some of the first I radioactive isotopes that were used were coming from CERN. So you already see this uh, synergy. So these detectors, they will, because they are very fast, they will allow to identify the tumors with higher precision. There are also developments, for example, by my colleagues at the University of Geneva, which are using other material to reach the same gain, and also they are the same goal. There are also colleagues in Krakow that are using a totally different type of detectors, where they will soon try to produce a full-body positron emission tomography device, which is affordable. So going from the detectors, these ones are used for PET imaging. But there is one more type of detector coming from CERN, which is related to X-rays. And in this video, you can see a 3D scan of somebody's wrist, which was taken using so-called color X-ray. So X-ray. So what it is? It's also a technology coming from uh, from CERN. We are looking. We are really sensitive to the energy of X-rays that are reaching the detector. This is what normally is not utilized until uh, in medicine. And in this case, different types of, for example, bone, uh, soft tissues, they will absorb the x-rays in a different way, and the energy of the x-ray that's reaching the detector is uh, different. And uh, it's a certain technology, but the spin-off is actually all the way in New Zealand, and only now, a few months ago, we've had the first device of this type that has arrived also in the Lausanne Hospital to diagnose uh, patients using this technology. We've looked at accelerators, at detectors, and now we come to what is closest to to me is the radioactivity. So one topic is so-called terranostics, using unstable isotopes. So first of all, what is terranostics, and then what are isotopes? Terranostics stands for therapy and diagnosis at the same time. Isotopes is, of course, all the things we have in our bodies. These isotopes inside of us and around us are normally stable. They do not change. They do not disintegrate. What we are working with, for example, at the Isolde laboratory are isotopes that are unstable, they change, and they emit radiation. And what you see here is uh, one of the first uh, examples of terranostics, in this case performed with uh, gadolinium and lutetium uh, isotopes. This is a patient that, as you can imagine, had metastasis of prostate cancer everywhere in the body. That person was diagnosed with a positron emission tomography, gadolinium isotope, and treated with a lutetium isotope at the same time. And you can see the snapshots over the weeks of the treatment. The person doesn't have any, any cancer anymore. At this moment, we go one step further. We are trying isotopes which are emitting alpha particles. These are particles which are even heavier, and they do more damage in the cancer cell. And the video on this slide is supposed to show you a little bit. So what's happening? We have these radioactive isotopes, which are connected to a biological ligand. Inside the cell, there are many, or inside here, there are many cells. And those ones that have, for example, high metabolism will link to the biological ligand. This is also where the alpha particles will be emitted. So only the cancerous cells will 
be killed, whereas the healthy cells will remain, will remain he healthy, they will not die. And this is the idea of the therapy part. The diagnosis, what is new, for example, at Isolde, we're working a lot with terbium isotopes. This is a chemical element where one of the isotopes can give you a positron emission detection signal. The other one can treat cancer at the same time. And we are now at the level of first cl clinical trials. So you really do terranostics. And finally, in the remaining time, I'll come even closer to my own research, which is connected to nuclear magnetic resonance. So magnetic resonance imaging has been used in hospitals already for some time. And this is the uh, technique which requires magnetic, high magnetic fields. What you see to the left is uh, a device which is the strongest magnet used for human MRI. That one is located in the Saclay, close to Paris. And this is where you can really diagnose different conditions, uh, the human body with very high resolution. In the project on which, in which I'm a partner, which you see to the right, we are developing a very compact device which has an extremely low magnetic field, which will be still about a billion times more sensitive than normal magnetic resonance because we will use radioactive isotopes and we will also play with their properties. So uh, with xenon isotopes, we hope uh, that patients will be able to inhale the xenon to look at the, their lungs or also to look at brain diseases. And this is a project we started recently. So with these examples, I was trying to show you that I think we are on a good path to meet the basic science with the doctor's office. There are techniques at different levels. And uh, I think that we're we, we go getting there because we are collaborating, because we do have an interdisciplinary approach. And we also dare to do novel things that nobody before us has done. And I think with this note, I thank you. Thank you, Magda. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Magda. So we are here at CERN discussing health tech, but of course the raison d'etre for CERN is particle uh, physics. But as we have seen, there are a lot of direct links between the research performed here and what happens in health research and health technology. So I would like to go a bit deeper into that and into how CERN thinks about uh, this part of their activities. And for that, I would like to invite on stage to join me the Director of International Relations for CERN, Charlotte Varakaule. <laughs> Charlotte, thank you, thank you for being with us. How, how does CERN think of that health aspect of the research that happens here under our feet and on campus? Thank you very much, uh, Bruno. As we have already heard, obviously, what we do here at CERN is fundamental research in particle physics. We try to understand what happened in the very first fractions of a second after the Big Bang and how the universe evolved in that very, very early moment. So this is fundamental research, basic science that is not necessarily connected directly with health. But health care and also medical applications, as we also heard from my colleague Magdalena just before, is really a great example of how fundamental research is a driver of innovation with deep societal impact well beyond the individual field of science. Um, novel ideas, novel techniques, technologies that have come from the field of particle physics have played an increasingly important role in healthcare over the past hundred years. Every day we see in clinical practice how uh, technologies from particle accelerators, detectors and also physics computing are vital in diagnostics and in treatment and also in medical and in biomedical uh, research. And of course, this doesn't happen just by itself. There's an active promotion behind that to ensure that this, these technologies can fulfill their potential. We work with partners in order to take these technologies to a maturity level. We work often with industry in order to ensure knowledge transfer so that the transformative potential and benefits of fundamental research really can serve society in the widest possible way. Charlotte, a lot of the work that's done here is not specifically on particle physics, but is on data. Data is actually handling data, capturing them, storing them, sharing them, analyzing them is like the principal side business of, of, of CERN. Uh, now, that's also very, very important uh, for, uh, uh, for health. And data keeps growing exponentially. I mean, 30 years ago, the web was invented here to manage data. 
many things are happening in the meantime. Where are we now in that space and how does it relate to the topic of today? I think that's a very, very pertinent point. So indeed, particle physics makes very heavy use of large scale computing. And of course, grids are ideal tools to handle the large volumes of data that come from the Large Hadron Collider, but can also be used when it comes to wide applications in the biomedical field, from screening candidates for drugs, or image analysis, or even sharing and uh, protecting health records. And this is also an area where CERN works very actively with partners in order to ensure that the expertise and the knowledge that we have can really serve as widely as possible. Just a couple of recent examples from the COVID pandemic. In at the peak of the pandemic, one of the important contributions of CERN to the collective effort to combat the virus was the Open Access Data Repository, Sonodo. And here, the uh, reputation of CERN for excellence, but also as a platform of neutrality, really enabled different communities to come together to share data through this platform. We also developed during the pandemic a risk, uh, a s risk management tool to model the concentration of viruses in enclosed spaces, which is, of course, enormously helpful for space management. So I guess that's an example of particle physics directly in your office space. And now <laughs> we're working with the WHO to develop both Sonodo, but also this risk management tool even further. One last question. During the, day, during the event, we want to talk quite a bit about science collaboration at scale. And very often when we talk about that in different scientific uh, um, uh, fields, the CERN example comes into the discussion. Oh, there is a CERN model. Can that serve as a framework for potential future collaborations? Not that they're going to be hosted here, but uh, you know, there is a model, there is an experience, there is a way of doing. Tell us a little bit about the CERN model and how they can inspire other collaborations in other fields. It's true that, of course, CERN and indeed the entire field of particle physics has a long-standing tradition uh, and experience in collaboration. And I think that what we have learned over the past close to seven decades of collaboration is that, that this is really driven by having a common goal, but also having shared values. Uh, collaborations in particle physics will bring together thousands of scientists from across the world, really driven in identifying a common goal. They come together in large, um, in, in large collaborations where the decision making is driven by consensus. Sometimes that can take time, that can be challenging, but it is something that ensures that there is sustainability in the implementation of the decisions that are taken. Management structures are often quite light, quite flexible, and that also allows for good decision making over time. But I think above and beyond that, really important are those shared values that underpin and really drive this collaboration. And for me, the most important ones are really openness, it's diversity, and it's reciprocity, because when it comes to sharing, reciprocity is very, very important. And openness is really within the DNA of CERN. It's within our convention from 1954, a very visionary document. And this is now translated into a policy of open science, promoting publishing in open access journals, uh, open software, and open hardware. And it's also this emphasis on openness that allows us to work across disciplines, working with others in a multidisciplinary fashion and also across, uh, across borders. So I think the main lesson here is really to, um, to work uh, in a collaborative manner, in an open manner, uh, based on reciprocity. And we hope very much that this is a model that can also inspire others to achieve their scientific ambitions through collaboration. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank, Thank you for being with us. us. In one of the fields where this discussion is actually happening is uh, quantum computing. You may have heard a couple of weeks ago the JESDA uh, conference in Geneva had that as one of the main topics and the, the, the notion at the end was, do we need a CERN for quantum uh, computing? Uh, question mark. So before we, we go to the next speaker, I would like to take a minute to mention and to thank the partners of this event uh, because they have supported it from the very beginning, including through the uncertainties of the pandemic year. So we will definitely not be here without them. They're Rolex and the Fondation Didier and Martin Prima. And I would like a big applause for both of them. <laughs> and this year we have another uh, partner uh, is the Open Access Science Journal Frontiers, which is based here in Switzerland, and particularly their initiative Frontiers for Young Mind. 
uh, which is an uh, uh, initiative where articles, science articles, are written by children to be peer reviewed by children. It's an interesting way to get kids engaged with uh, science. They even had a series of articles written by Nobel Prize winners to be peer reviewed by 12 year old kids. And so two of the writers are joining us tomorrow at the Sparks Forum. They're going to write a summary of the day intended to be peer reviewed by kids. And if it gets through the peer review, then we're going to send it to you and it's going to be uh, published. So thanks also to uh, Frontiers. Now, with the next talk, we're going to move up to the top of our body and set our minds to our mind, because mental health is a massive topic. And our next speaker joins us today to talk about using augmented and virtual reality to treat some mental uh, issues. He's a chair of cognitive neuroprosthetics at EPFL, the Swiss Institute of uh, Technology. He runs here in Geneva the Lab of Cognitive Neuroscience. Please welcome Olaf Blanke. Uh, thanks, Bruno. Um, what happens when we put on a virtual reality headset? What happens in our brains when we're immersed into virtual reality? Virtual reality seems, if we look around, it seems to be all over the place. It has arrived in the workplace, business meetings. It's important for social media, social interaction, and of course for gaming, a major driving force in gamer, gaming and the metaverse. There is not just VR. We have AR, MR, XR. Uh, don't worry, I won't go through all the definitions, but VR being on the virtual side, everything's controlled, everything is digital, whereas AR adds, augmented reality will add digital objects to the real world. And MR being something in between and XR being really sort of an overview uh, term for all these technologies. But has XR or robotics, have they arrived in medicine? So we've talked or we've seen on one of the slides before that for training it is important. Surgeons in particular have used XR and robotics technology to develop something called minimally invasive surgery. So minimally invasive surgery allows to minimize incisions and instead of large scars, also minimize other major post-operative complications. But going back to what I'm interested in, what happens when you put a head-mounted uh, display or virtual reality headset on, on uh, when you're wearing it, well, the surgeon that you see on the, on the, on the bottom right the person in the, in the green shirt, well, he's not really having his hands in the patient's body. He's really two meters away, and the patient is somewhere over on the right side, and robotic tools are carrying out the minimal invasive surgery. What creates this connection between the hands of the surgeon, and how does it feel, actually, to be basically just mon uh, manipulating objects inside the patient's body? And I think we need, or oh it may be helpful, Obviously, I think it, it will be helpful. I'm a neuroscientist. Let's look at the brain and how are the hands of the surgeon represented under normal conditions. Take your own hand, for example, your own left hand. You can look at it, and that goes to the, to the red spot in the back of the brain. That's a visual hand. I can close my eyes, and I still feel it. That's proper reception or position sense. I can touch it. It's a third hand representation, and I can make some sound. And so your, your brain is having four different left hand representations. A very important area or areas actually processing these informations are actually outside these four regions. And those are the regions that I'm going to argue are key for XR, are also key where the surgeon can operate and manipulate those tools at a distance inside um, the patient's uh, body. We can study these mechanisms um, in the research lab, studying, for example, the, um, the so-called rubber hand illusion. And what is done here, so the experimenter in the green shirt and um, the, the, the subject in the blue shirt, and the video will, will come a few more times. Uh, um, no worries, Th there's ethics you get very easily for these kind of experiments. So there is a hidden hand. This is the proprioceptive hand I was referring to before. And there's a touch cue applied to this hand. And then there's this ridiculously looking rubber hand in front of him. And what happens in this illusion is that this real hand representation, let me move on, otherwise uh, you will not listen and just look at the video. <laughs> um, so the hidden hand is normally where, of course, our hand is represented and field is my hand. 
There's, however, this visual hand, this other representation in the brain, and the visual hand representation dominates whenever there is touch coming from two positions. Now, of course, normally when I feel touch, this is happening right where my real hand really is. But the simple experiment shows if I put the hand away and put another cue, a visual hand, not even looking like a hand, at the corresponding position, and there's a touch cue applied visually on the fake hand, the rubber hand, and at the same time in the hidden hand, the brain starts believing that that's actually my hand. Now, of course, and, and, and yeah, this just to, take, uh, to, to bring this message again, but what happens if we're using virtual reality in this sense, right? We could get rid of this uh, uh, virtual hand, oh sorry, of the, of the pink glove, of the rubber hand, and we could now show virtual hands. Virtual hands of different color, virtual hands of different size, virtual hands in different positions gives us an amazing amount of flexibility. And many of my colleagues have done exactly this kind of research. What we were interested in, if my hand is not where my physical hand really is, but I believe that this virtual hand is my own hand, could this come with benefits for pain, for chronic pain, for example? If my hand is painful and I create a virtual hand representation, can that overwrite painful hand representations? And that's exactly what we're able to find in a number of studies. And what you can see here in this, in this video is that we didn't use a touch cue to represent the own body representation, but we illuminated the hand, as you can see here, with the heartbeats each heartbeat that we measured online from each of these patients and we illuminated the hand in synchronous fashion. So there's another somatic hand representation which we, which we decrease by showing a cardiacly enhanced uh, virtual hand because that's again something you can do in virtual reality. You can create entirely new links that, that people have not been exposed to. So the nice findings in that study were that the pain was immediately decreased in a chronic pain patient and also that the force, so the usage of that hand which is decreased in pain conditions um, also increased. So two other examples here, and I see that my time is, 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 is moving quickly. So artificial hands prosthetic devices for amputee patients. We've also shown that VR is an amazing technology where future prosthetic limbs should not just be able to carry out simple movements, but they should feel just like a real hand. And again, augmented reality here can be used, for example, to illuminate the hand under certain conditions. Again, imagine a cardiovisual stimulation like I've just shown you before. This is very a versatile technology, digital um, uh, therapies like this, these immersive therapies, because not only hand therapies, but also for the face, particularly for the leg, these stimulations can be combined as well. Uh, the slides, well, three um, um, other messages. First of all, I mentioned it already, can be personalized. It can also be combined with many, other, uh, with many other, other therapies, like pharmacology, for example. In the middle, a COVID study on breathing comfort that we carried out. Again, the virtual reality technology we developed can be done in the clinic, can be done at the doctor's office, but can also be done at home, which is very important, where we want patients uh, to carry out uh, uh, many of these um, continuous uh, therapies. I want to move on to my last topic, which is that what really I'm passionate about, these applications are very important, but it's XR is a basic research technology. Neuroscience needs XR in order to study consciousness and how the body is represented um, in the brain. So we've taken the rubber hand illusion. Remember, this was the hidden hand where the touch cue was applied at the same time then with the virtual uh, hand. What we've done here is that we link a touch cue again that cannot be seen on the back of our subjects. And then while the subjects were feeling a touch in the back, they were seeing an avatar in front two meter distance, and now something very similar happens. Before the brain had to weigh, where am I? At the hidden hand or the visual hand? And here, something similar has to happen. Am I standing here where I perceive the touch cue or standing over there two meters in, in front? And you will not be surprised. Using this, this setup, we were able to also manipulate where people experience. We can entirely take them out of their bodies and embody avatars that, that can be seen. Again, this comes with analgesic effects, but what was really interesting is from a point of view, what is the topic today? What is needed to really immerse people into virtual reality? Imagine you could, or your brain could generate the feeling that you really are in virtual reality and not in real reality anymore. This leads to something called out-of-body experiences, which have been reported from time immemorial, but virtual reality and these kind of multi-sensory stimulations I presented to you can be used in order to engineer such sensations. Um, and sort of the next conference uh, that we have. I mean, we're all very happy to be back in real reality and meet here at CERN, but in the future, of course, if these 
many Zoom calls, these too many Zoom calls that we had, if you could meet in a virtual immersive environment and really feel there, I think potential um, for this is really large. Again, this slide to remind myself also, we're doing a lot of neuroscience, so we have to adapt all these virtual reality technologies, not just to the patient and to uh, behavioral studies, but also to MRI scanners, like we've heard in the, in the previous example. So this is a very noisy, very tiny environment, so, so VR has to be adapted to this environment. We're also working with drones and aviation um, 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 uh, robotics in order to enhance still these changes uh, of flight simulation, but also um, disembodiment. And then the two slides at the bottom, or the two images at the bottom, really to remind me that for 5,000 years, humans have been fascinated. Different forms of avatars you can see on, 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 on that slide, how we can project and what is projected in terms of, of, of the soul and other representations of the, of the self. Here are my three uh, take home messages. Um, the body is key is really the main message, but in technology terms, the body is key. If we want to achieve strong immersion into virtual environments, we need to control bodily stimuli and we need to systematically map them into immersive virtual world. The, the scientific conclusion is, well, the good news are that we don't need to completely reverse engineer the body. We don't need each of the ten fingers and the ten toes. We can take certain parts particularly the trunk, but also hand representations. And we don't need to look at all these four regions. We need to manipulate and control those regions of multisensory integration. And then, of course, the last part, which is the topic um, of, of health and medicine, but also well-being, that controlling via X XR the body representation in the brain, this is an amazing avenue to bring therapies right here in the West in the US, but also, I think, across the globe. Uh, where many people will have smartphones and similar devices where uh, entirely new forms of, of virtual reality can be developed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf. And of course, we want to use virtual reality to extend Sparks, so not to replace it because we want to keep meeting uh, in real life here over the next years. So over the last two years, we have all experienced firsthand the impact of the pandemic, but we have not experienced it equally. Actually, if at all, we have uh, uh, really seen firsthand how access to healthcare is unequally distributed around the world. There's a broad agreement that by and large, the health system is broken, and all not only in terms of, of, of delivery of cure, but also uh, on its economic fundamentals. How do we reinvent it? Our next speaker has some thoughts about that, an interesting analysis and some uh, ideas on how to move forward. She's a visiting policy fellow at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London. Please welcome Els Torella. Thank you so much. Medicines should not be a luxury. That is the conviction with which I stand here, both as a biomedical researcher and also as a global health act advocate. COVID, as already was, uh, has been said, has created the perfect storm for us to see how the current medical innovation model is broken and why we must, must indeed rethink and in reinvent it. Thanks to uh, over 20 years of research, advances by many researchers in many different places, often supported by pub public funding, we actually were able, it was a formidable achievement that we were able in less than a year to produce multiple effective vaccines. And of course, the pharmaceutical industry played a big role, in particular in scaling up the manufacturing of those vaccines. But we have collectively failed to make these life-saving technologies accessible equi equi equitably uh, in many parts of the world. Um, and this has many reasons, but including that our governments have started to hoard vaccines to uh, protect their population first, some governments, and at the same time, companies uh, have considered the vaccines as private property that they could sell to the highest bidder and at the same time make uh, a lot of profits. It hasn't always been like that. Sorry. 
Uh, it hasn't always been like that, and we have uh, examples from the past, think about insulin, about the polio vaccines, where actually m major medical breakthroughs were developed, made widely available, without patents, and without that profit-driven business strategy behind. However, since the 1980s, 90s, our governments have decided uh, that uh, the, the responsibility for the development and the making available of new uh, medicines and vaccines should be left to the private sector, and then evidently with profit motive as the main uh, driving force. Now, that make gives us a bit of a design problem, because to make that profit motive functioning, we needed to create, uh, uh, to privatize knowledge through patents, through patent monopolies. But if you think about how patents are, uh, why patents are awarded, there are three main criteria. One is that uh, something needs to be new, it needs to be inventive, and there needs to be commercial applicability. There is no criteria that talks about improving health outcomes. And that is why if you have a, p a medical innovation model where patents are the main driving force, you actually have a growing misalignment between people's health needs and the actual products that are being developed. If you look, for instance, at the data of uh, the, the, last, the last 10 years of all medical um, uh, treatments that have been registered, you can see that actually a large uh, majority, 67%, are not better than what we already have. On the other hand, we have roughly 25% of true medical advances, of which 2%, very little, are true medical breakthroughs. At the same time, we have many unmet medical needs for which actually no research and development happens. And I think uh, the very well-known one is antimicrobial uh, resistance. We have this major threat and very little research and developing happening. And then finally, for the few m real medical breakthroughs that we have had, and we've heard already some of it uh, today, for instance, CAR-T, these m treatments are made available at prices that are just impossible for health systems uh, to afford. So that is why we need change. We must rethink the business model underlying medical innovation, such that it delivers medicines and vaccines that we actually need, to improve people's health and deliver them as common goods, not as luxury commodities such as jewelry. And so what can be done? I, I want to focus on three issues that I think are, uh, could be transformative. The first one is that we need to foster collective intelligence and share data and no knowledge to drive the medical innovation for access, not for profit. And instead of, of doing what we do today, is often uh, doing competition between proprietary technologies. For this, of course, we need public leadership. Public leadership accompanied with public finance and uh, a leadership that can set the priorities uh, for health. And then we need equity from the start, meaning that we need to share the technology plat platforms and the tools to do medical innovation with many more researchers across the world so that they can actually drive innovation to uh, address their own uh, health needs. Now, you may think this is utopian, but actually many of that is already happening on a relatively small scale. I think that every scientist, and uh, here at, at CERN we've already heard it's a core value, would agree that the most productive way to make scientific progress is actually to share ideas, to share di data, to build up upon each other's ideas. And I, if I think about my own experience, when I did my PhD in biomedical research in the 1990s, we didn't used to take out patents, to, uh, keep da data secret, etc. There was a lot of collaboration and we there was a lot of medical advances being made as well. And then a bit later, when I was working with the not-for-profit organization DNDI, the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, that I was one of the founding members at when I was with Médecins Sans Frontières, we actually managed to develop a new drug for sleeping sickness without patents, based on full collaboration and making all the data open. So it is totally possible because this drug is currently available for patients. So second, what we need is indeed this public finance and leadership to drive medical innovation that is fit for purpose. 
It's often said that well, R&D is so expensive, we need private finance uh, to, to do it, and that's why we've created that for-profit model uh, of medical innovation, such that we can create profitability for investors and shareholders. But the reality is that because we're talking about health, there are massive amounts of uh, finances going to the different steps of the R&D process. And if you will remember for the COVID vaccines, many of the vaccines have uh, received massive public support, first of all, in the years preceding COVID, then during the, the, the COVID pandemic, the R&D and the manufacturing. And at the end of the day, it is public money that has bought the vaccines to be distributed uh, to, to the populations. And it's not just COVID, actually in many instances, it's actually the government that pays early research, contributes to the R&D, and in the end pays for the medicines and vaccines, often at a relatively inflated price, not to say sometimes exorbitant, and that is actually what makes the whole medical innovation system today uh, sustainable from a business perspective. But what happens with all that profit? Only a very tiny fraction actually gets reinvested in R&D. Most of it actually is extracted from the medical innovation uh, ecosystem and goes to the pockets of the investors and the shareholders. And it doesn't benefit future research, as is often being said. So what if? Instead, our governments use the money that they now put into paying for these very expensive medicines and massively invest them in research and development, not for profit, but for health for in, and deliver medicines as common goods that are available and affordable where needed. Or what about creating uh, a CERN for medical innovation, bringing governments together, not just on the basic science and the early stuff, but really taking medicines and vaccines that we need for public health all the way through and making them available uh, affordably to the population. And thirdly, the importance of sharing technology platform. I want to uh, give an example here, a great example that is currently happening, and we have one of the uh, leaders, so two of the leaders actually in the room here, uh, Dr. Sumia and uh, Dr. Petro, who is in the back. An important initiative spearheaded by the World Health Organization that will contribute to build more equity in our collective capacity to innovate and produce the critical health tools we need. And so this is an initiative where there is uh, an effort ongoing to develop the mRNA vaccine platform technology in South Africa. And once it will be uh, up to date, uh, or up to date, uh, where it will be ready, it will be shared with at least 15 vaccine producers in uh, middle-income countries that will not only be able to produce the vaccine, but also employ, deploy the mRNA technology to do their local innovation uh, in the future. So I think, in my opinion, we cannot let this biggest health crisis of all of our lifetime go by without really thinking carefully, how can we do this much better? I think it's time to truly innovate, not just the science and the technology of which we talk all, ta all the time, but in the way we incentivize and use that scientific progress to actually serve global public health. I think we need to m redress the economic rules of the game to make our health system, our health innovation system, again, fit for purpose, with which I mean addressing people's health needs and ensuring equitable access to all where and when needed. And I will leave you with this quote to think about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. So I would like to end this session by putting a specific lens to the future. There is a sort of gathering scenario where not only our lives, but our entire economy may be changed by genomics in the way it was changed over the last 30 years by the digital revolution. And so I want to bring in Andrew Hessel, live from uh, uh, California, to discuss that. Andrew has many hats. He's a microbiologist and entrepreneur. The co-author of a book called The Genesis Machine, Our Quest to Rewrite Life in the Age of Synthetic Biology. Andrew, are you with us? Can you hear me? 
I am. Hi, Bruno. Good, Excellent. Good afternoon. Hi, Andrew. Uh, thank you for being with us. So, Andrew, in uh, there. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was <laughs> that screen. Uh, Andrew, it has been about a couple of decades since uh, the Human Genome Project, and uh, the cost of an individual sequencing of a genome went down from many thousands of dollars to just a few hundreds. Now we have factories that uh, sequence genomes. And uh, I've, I've heard you talk about this in terms of a genomics economy based on genomic networks. Tell us what you mean by genomics economy. Well, sequencing any genome costs money. Again, as you alluded to, the, the very first ones cost millions of dollars. The f very first one cost a billion dollars. But now it's, it's sub $1,000, and we can extract a lot of value out of this genomic information. We're just learning how to interpret it and extract value for both health and potentially economy. Uh, whether it's medicine development, whether it's whether it's understanding how our um, how our various traits link to uh, the way a drug is developed and, and so on. So there is an emerging biological economy coming from the world of genomic sequence information. Now, you sent us a slide which you're going to project now that basically tries to describe how the actual value of the sequenced genome is way higher than the cost to sequence that. Describe and decrypt this, this graph for us. Okay, the, the line that's sloping downward is the cost of DNA sequencing, which again has exponentially decreased faster than Moore's law. So we, we've, seen, we've seen the cost of sequencing plummet. We crossed an inflection point several years ago where the value that we can extract from the average genome exceeds the cost of sequencing if it's amortized over a few years. What this, what this produces is the potential for a positive feedback effect where a company, for example, can come along and say, we will sequence you for free because they know how to extract more value out of your genome in terms of these various uh, uh, types of opportunities, diagnostic tests, personalized medicine, et cetera, that now creates a runaway effect where they can keep adding people to their network and generating a surplus economically every time. I'm expecting this to tip over any sometime soon. And when it happens and is done well, in the same way that Google and Facebook have learned to, to generate economy from their participants, we're going to see uh, essentially billions of people and their genomes come online in a very... This is due to happen. We're, we're poised on this economic cliff now. So uh, are you saying that we're going to kind of go from big tech to big gen and these companies are kind of going to control that value? The, there's, there's a real possibility of that. What, we've, what we're already seeing with some of the companies on the forefront of genome sequencing is they're making it very clear that this is your data. This is your program, essentially. But they're acting more as an agent or a representative or, or knowledge extractor. And they'll split the profits in the same way that Apple splits the profits from software developers on their platform. So, but it, you know, they can optimize for different things, whether it's you want to get your best health information or whether you want to make more money from your genome. But there, there, it looks like it, there's an, uh, there will be a big gen company, what I described in an article is the Google of genomics, um, poised to appear. So another topic that you've been uh, um, writing about and talking about is digital twins. Explain what you mean and how that relates to health. Well, in the same way that your genome really represents your program, we're leaving more and more digital information in our lives today, whether it's our emails, our social media, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of that information can be gathered and, and collected to make a very good 
digital representation of you, almost a digital twin. This can go down at a systems level, your whole body, if your body's been scanned, right down to the cellular level today, which you can think of as a virtual twin of a, of, of a living cell, which is now increasingly testable. So these digital twins, or you can think of them as avatars, are going to become much more important for understanding a, a, an individual, their health, their development, um, their metabolism, and so on. So this is where we. This is um, going to be, I believe, one of the main applications of AI analysis and and the uh, incredible amount of digital information that we're collecting about each other. Andrew, you're you're involved with a company that uh, works on developing new viruses, and the uh, intention is to attack cancer cells. And uh, what you do is basically programming a, a, a virus is is a work based on data. Now, if we can program a virus with benign intent, that probably means that we can also program one with malicious intent. Are we entering a time of very easy virus design? Yeah, so I, I've been working in the field of synthetic biology now for over a decade, which is really learning how to program biological systems. And the easiest things to program, because they have the smallest programs, uh, are viruses. And, and you ha I look at viruses as essentially USB sticks, memory drives, um, that need a cell, uh, which you can think of as a computer, to execute the programs, but they're very specific for plugging in. So we design viruses that when they, when they dock with a cancer cell, essentially load a program that says, cancer cell, you need to die. Um, but just like software that we may have on a, a computer software on a USB stick, it can deliver a useful program or it can deliver malware. So I think we're in probably the most um, significant period in biotechnology for the next 20 years where we have to figure out the right systems to, pr to drive it towards positive applications and minimize the potential for, for biological hacking, so to speak. Are those 20 years only significant or also problematic and risky? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it, there, we're at this point where it's very, uh, the tools for designing these very simple agents, viruses and other infectious diseases are becoming, um, are, are now accessible and affordable for a larger group of people, raising the possibility of hacking. But these tools can also be one of the most powerful uh, tools for, for medicine, for uh, climate change and, and for manufacturing because cells uh, really are, are the most efficient and sustainable form of making the things that humans need, whether it's food or medicines or materials. I'm going to ask you a question about climate change in a sec, but uh, you were recently here in Geneva for a conversation and a conference about science and policy. How solid is our policy process and infrastructure to confront, to understand and confront the things you have been discussing so far? Well, you know, there's there's policies that have been in place for managing, for managing economies, for imagine, for for managing science and large groups of science like CERN, um, the and 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 politics, uh, just the relationships between countries. I don't think these systems that we have today, which are very high touch, often very personal, very paper based, are going to work. For these digital for digital biology, um, this digital biology can move at the speed of software because you can think of the cells as the computers. They're already there. They're just waiting for us to be able to write better programs. I think we're going to need a digital layer of these types of uh, of, of regulatory mechanisms. Um, that are working 24-7 in real time alongside these digital tools in the same way that the internet today has a, has a digital security layer that keeps all of our systems up and running in the background that is really not transparent to the person sitting down and, and accessing a website or their bank, et cetera. Andrew, one last question. You mentioned climate change. And of course, when we talk about uh, sequencing a genome, we are not only talking about the human genome, we're talking about all of, of life. To what extent do you think genomics can help us confront the climate and uh, biodiversity crisis? 
I think it's the most powerful technology that we have. We're, we're, we're as successful as we are today because of, um, you know, we've, we've used natural resources heavily to, to build society. Now I think we're coming around and realizing all these ecosystems, all these organisms are really important. We don't know that much about them. So there's efforts today to go in and collect genomes from every known species, sequence them, archive them, biobank them, and soon we'll actually start to engineer them to to help replace endanger to help prop up endangered species, even um, de-extinct some of the recently lost species. But more than that, start to use these biotechnologies, engineer them precisely in controlled environments to help to help um, produce the things that we need. Um, uh, for the future in a much more sustainable way than we've been able to do in the past with chemical technologies. So I, I look at it as a shift from natural resources to supernatural resources. And genomics is going to be a major part of that work. Andrew, thank you for being with us and sharing your knowledge with this, this uh, audience. Thank you very much. Andrew Hassan. Thank you so much. And so this ends session uh, one. Uh, first of all, I would like a big applause for all the speakers who have been on stage this morning. <laughs> so we're going to have a break uh, now. Be back here at uh, uh, 6 p.m. Geneva time for the second session. Stay seated for a sec, because first I need to say goodbye to those who are online. Uh, thank you for being with us. 6 p.m. Geneva time, second session. We're going to see you back then. For now, we're going to end the live stream. Uh, goodbye. See you. See you later. And for us here, coffee is being served on the back of the auditorium. The toilets are downstairs. Uh, please be seated a couple of minutes before session uh, two, 6 p.m., so we can start right on time. I'll see you there. Thank you.
So welcome back, everyone. Welcome back also to those who are watching uh, online and joining the live stream for the second session. So the topic of the day is future technologies for health. During the first session, we explored developments in brain therapy, cancer, genomics, viruses, and much more. And now we're going to shift a bit the perspective and look at personalized health and look at how we can prevent people from getting sick in the first place, plus the context of all that. And we're going to start with the context. Uh, and so to kick off the conversation, I want to bring in uh, live from California, Jane Metcalf. Uh, now, many of you may know her name or may know her, uh, but uh, probably all of you have been influenced by her work because 30 years ago, she was the co-founder of Wired magazine, which has been accompanying many of us uh, uh, through the digital revolution and for some of us even helping us play a role in, uh, in, uh, in it. Now she runs and edits Neo Life, which is a media platform looking uh, at the neo biological revolution. So let's see if Jane is with us. Jane, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Excellent, excellent. Welcome to Sparks, Jane. Uh, Thank you. To start, uh, give us your definition of the neo biological revolution. So I consider the neobiological revolution essentially the next phase of the digital revolution. When we take all of our fancy digital tools and godlike technologies to engineer human biology, basically to transform our own species. What are you most excited about? Well, this is like asking me, which one of my babies do I love most? <laughs> there are... well, okay, sure, which one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I fall in love with technology. I get very excited about this stuff. And I'm very excited about using technology to transform health and solve some of the problems that have plagued us for, for um, millennia. Um, of course, the mRNA platform is astonishing. And um, using that not only to create the COVID vaccine, um, but to do all kinds of treatments um, in a fraction of the time at a fraction of the cost, that's incredibly exciting. Um, you know, it's essentially biological software that can be used even beyond its therapeutic um, potential. So we're gonna see a lot of creative ways um, that mRNA can be used. Um, CRISPR is, you know, gene editing continues to evolve to become more precise. We're moving into clinical trials now for blood disorders like sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia, or lung cancer, genetic blindness. Um, there's a lot of exciting applications for CRISPR coming up um, in agriculture as well to help um, reduce the inputs um, like water, fertilizer, pesticides, um, create longer shelf lives, et cetera. But I'm also excited about non-invasive technologies like focused ultrasound, which is not just a diagnostic tool, but can also be used for treatment. Um, and other things like um, magnets and electricity for neurotech as opposed to invasive surgeries. But, you know, kind of over all of this is the role of artificial intelligence. And, you know, that can be used for everything from improved diagnostics. But but it also helps us, you know, move beyond just reading into writing. And, you know, you can use a generative AI program now to create protein design machines and cell factories. So there's just there's an explosion of technologies with incredible opportunity. And it's a very exciting time to be looking at these things. So Jane, this field is moving very, very fast, but it seems to be moving a little bit kind of organic. There is no master plan. There is no uh, strategic plan. Uh, you know, people are just tweaking and trying and, and moving forward and, 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 and so on. Uh, describe a bit the, 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 how can I say, the dynamics of this, of this space between companies and researchers and science and so on. 
Yeah, you know, when I first started looking at all these technologies, my thought was, wow, we now have the possibility of transforming, you know, homo sapiens. So what's our vision? Like, what's the what's the strategic plan? Mm -hmm. Who's got the creative brief? What's the product roadmap? You know, it's just this stuff is springing up. And whose job is it to think about the future of our species? Um, and, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, as scientists, um, people are trained to become experts, but they're experts in an increasingly narrow field as they go deeper and deeper into it. And what we need to do is move from the kind of mapping that we've been doing, ah, here's the cell and here's how it works, here's the molecule, here's how it works, into thinking about these things as like complex systems. And we need experts in one field to be able to be neophytes in another field, to be able to say, okay, here's what I can bring to the table. What do you know? How can we put this all together to understand the enormous complexity of, of the mechanisms here and also you know, think strategically about where we're going? I don't, you know, most of the molecular biologists I know don't want to be responsible, solely responsible for making the big decisions about how we deploy these technologies. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned before that you co-founded Wired almost 30, 30 years ago. What kind of similarities do you see, and especially what kind of lessons did we learn from observing and, and accompanying the digital revolution that could be useful today if we take them into consideration? Well, I think about this all day long. Um, I mean, for one thing, you know, we built our first computer, let's say, 100 years ago, um, and we're pretty good at reverse engineering that and understanding how it works, you know, and my favorite engineers will talk about their technology working auto magically, you know, just as if, um, you know, humans have evolved over the course of millennia. And, um, you know, they, they are still full of magic and mystery and messiness. And there's so much we still don't know. We don't even know how many different types of cells there are in the body. We don't really understand the fundamentals of the human immune system. So, you know, magic and mystery uh, make the neobiological revolution a lot different than the digital revolution. Um, but it's also a completely different risk profile, right? I mean, we're talking life and death here. and. You know, it's also a highly regulated industry, whereas, you know, with the digital revolution, there was no regulation in place. So, you know, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from the digital revolution, but this is really quite different. Jane, to, to end, you are chairing a big project called the Global, uh, the Human Immunome Project. Uh, it's new, it just started, uh, but it promises to be a big global collaboration. What is the Immunome? What is the project? Tell us a little bit about that. So the immunome is, um, what is the immunome is a question we can debate for a very, very long, very long time to come. Um, what we consider the immunome is the, the cells, the organs, the tissues, the molecules that make up what we consider to be the human immune system. Um, but it's also your entire omics stack, you know? So it's your genome, it's your epigenome, it's your transcriptome, your metabolome, your microbiome. Um, it's, it's all of that stuff happening inside your body, but then it's also the exposome. It's all the stuff happening outside and around you. So that would include the food that you put into your body, the pollution and your toxins in your environment, you know, the stress that you're under. Um, so in order to really understand how the human immunome functions, we need to build a, a predictive model, a quantitative model that takes into consideration all of these different aspects and looks at this not as a 2D cartography exercise, but as a, a 3D complex system that we have to model, that, which is actually 4D because we have to model it over time. Your immune system as a newborn is not the same as your immune system as an elderly person. And so you know, we are looking to computational models and machine learning to help us understand both mechanistically what the underlying mechanisms might be that we haven't been able to observe or experiment on, but also phenomenological models that can give us patterns and information um, that can help us move forward even when we don't understand the underlying science. Mm -hmm. So the Human Immunome Project is, is, you know, it's kind of like the next stage after the Human Genome Project. It's, it's a global collaboration of scientists across all these disciplines coming together with this big audacious goal that some people think can't even be done yet. But you know, we're confident that with the group we're assembling um, and the vision that we're setting out, that we are gonna learn a lot um, and we're gonna move the field forward in ways that we are only beginning to understand now. 
who's who's involved now and who should be involved it's an incredible group we came together at the end of september with about 65 scientists from extraordinary um, research institutions and academic institutions, you know, Harvard, MIT, the Broad, um, Scripps, uh, UCSF, also in Europe, in um, the Middle East. Um, it's um, immunologists, computational systems biologists, machine learning experts. Um, it's people who are willing to think about these difficult challenges that we'll have who are willing to share their data to come together in a spirit of open collaboration so that we can move this field forward. And anybody who wants to contribute to this, I mean, I've been able to go to my friends from my Wired era um, and get people very excited from the um, AI side of things. They're very excited about having these enormous data sets um, that come out of the health and medical field and what they can do with them. So anybody who um, is interested in helping us move this forward, who has any of these skills, is welcome to reach out. Um, it's uh, it's it's going to take a village. It's going to take the whole world to make this happen. It seems it seems to be a pattern in today's discussions. It's going to take a village. Jane, thank you very much for joining us and for sharing uh, your knowledge with uh, the audience at Sparks. And uh, enjoy the rest well, of the day in California. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Now, if you want to know more about Jane's uh, vision and, and uh, her views on uh, this field, she opens the first episode of the podcast. And one of the things we did is that we asked her to put on a science fiction hat and imagine life of a human person, of a, a healthy human uh, in uh, 30 years time and what that would look like from a health perspective. So the first two or three minutes of the podcast are her scenario in 30 uh, years. Now, second topic for this session, which uh, relates to what uh, Jane said, because uh, it uh, touches on digital uh, device sensors and wearables. The speaker is a biomedical engineer and inventor. A few years back, he won the Rolex Award for developing a device for delivering vaccines without needles, which makes it cheaper, so more accessible, but also less painful. Now he has turned his attention to personalized medicine and personalized sensors that have the potential to alert against uh, heart attacks. Please welcome from Australia, Mark Kendall. Thank, thank you, Bruno. So we all know what this is, uh, the dashboard of a, of a car. Uh, 400 sensors feed the information to an average car for real-time information telling us what the car is doing. We take it for granted. Yet, uh, a family member of mine had a heart attack uh, a few years ago, and I was shocked when I watched the process of what that individual went through, the, the complete lack of useful information in real time that was inv available for treatment to happen. And so that got me thinking, uh, why do we have all of this information for a car, yet when it comes to us with, with our, our health, uh, there's very little in real time or next to none. There must be a better way. So. On the topic of heart attacks, it's a, it's a massive problem, and it's one of many. Uh, so there are about 18 million deaths per year due to heart attacks. And it's a very shocking uh, condition in many ways. Uh, one of the reasons why it's a problem is that it, you can have no notice and you could drop dead from a heart attack just walking on the street, as one example. And what's sad about that is that in many ways the problem is addressable. In its simplest form, the treatment for a heart attack can be as simple as taking taking an aspirin, if only you had the notice uh, to provide the intervention. So that led us to think about this in a little bit more depth. Now, the concept of medicine, of course, the overarching principle is the right medicine at the right place and at the right time. And there is much to celebrate about what has taken place in medicine. We've seen some of that today. So think about uh, vaccines as, as one example and how that's changed the course of human history. And there's others, antibiotics. We've heard today about CAR T cell therapies and the impact that's creating uh, in better treatment for, for cancer. So that's the right medicine and that's ongoing. The right place, again, that's an endeavor that's a bit younger. It's around 50 years or so in terms of genuine scientific effort. Uh, so that includes, of course, pills, and, uh, but also patches and other areas like that. 
But the right time, well, that's almost been the laggard. Uh, so, and it's not because we haven't been trying, it's because the information hasn't been available, the tools haven't been available for us to try and find and define those kinetics until about now. So how is the information currently gathered uh, for most of our interventions? Well, the main way this is done is a technique that was pioneered in the 1940s, which is taking a blood draw, sending it to a pathology lab, uh, quite often an expensive pathology lab, and then waiting some time before getting a result back. Now, it can be effective in many different situations, this is true, yet, Let's consider a, a couple of its attributes. The first is, of course, it's a needle-based approach, but uh, it's resource intensive. So we need a lot of resource in order to do this. So that's one issue, so it's not for everyone. But even when it does take place, the information comes back much later in time. And sadly, there are some situations where it's too late for the appropriate intervention to happen. Uh, sadly, people die. Let's flash forward to the, the last decade. Uh, there's been an explosion of today's wearables, uh, which are mostly lifestyle uh, style devices, uh, steps, uh, etc. Those, those sorts of things, heart rate. And one of the reasons why they're not used for high-end medical purposes is because of the amazing function of the skin. Now, the skin is a great barrier. We're all alive today because it's doing its job. It's keeping the bad stuff out and the good stuff in. When it comes to today's surface-based wearables, it's, it's blocking the ability to sense uh, the key information which resides just under uh, the skin. But what is happening in this space? This is a, a great example of what's happening right now and has been happening in the last few years. This is continuous glucose monitoring devices, and my hunch is that there's probably some people in the room today that are wearing uh, some of these, and I've just seen a, a flinch of a hand uh, there to acknowledge that. Uh, so how do they work? They're a wearable, but there's, there's a needle in that wearable, quite often a five millimeter needle. Sounds big, but it's, it's doing its job. And it measures your glucose levels. Now, for people that have type one diabetes, this is a complete game changer. It's completely changed the way they can manage their lives, and indeed, uh, it's, 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 it's just been fantastic. Now, that's been used millions of times and continued to grow, but you could call this a, the first marker of significance for wearables for precision medicine. But there's a lot more to come. And let me just walk you through a, a couple of examples uh, of this. So I took a look at uh, that particular approach and I thought about how big those needles are and the downsides associated with that. And I thought, well, maybe the, the next step is minimally invasive wearables where you can gain access to those signals, but without uh, all of the issues associated with, with a needle. So this is where some of my, my background and, and domain knowledge uh, came in. So I'm a biomedical engineer, and for the last 25 years, I've been working with the skin in many different ways with functional devices. As one example, uh, there's a patch that I've invented called a nano patch for needle-free vaccine delivery, and that's going forward in many different ways in clinical trials. And indeed, uh, the very first work that we did for uh, the developing world uh, was sponsored by Rolex for uh, where I went to Papua New Guinea and that's, that's going forward in many different ways. So using that domain knowledge, I turn my mind to this particular problem. And so this is the one embodiment that we're working on as a solution with my team at uh, We're Optimo and the Australian National University. So on the right hand side, what we see is a very, very small array of microelectrodes that just reach a hair's width into the skin, and by doing that, just go far enough to reach the signals that matter, but do it in a minimally invasive and a continuous way. And so that's the core principle of our particular approach, which is a micro but that's just one of many that are moving along uh, in this space of minimally invasive wearables. So. I'm going to do a live demonstration uh, today, and I uh, thought about this, and I thought I don't want to uh, participate in a heart attack. Uh, so instead, uh, what I decided to do was uh, work, uh, do a demonstration of something else as an example. So this is uh, one of our, our micro-wearable uh, sensors. Now, I should stress this is a, a prototype. This is not a product. There is much product development to be done. Uh, so I need to manage expectations, but, but still, it's going well and going strong. Now, the particular test case that I'm, I'm going to show today is as I mentioned, it's not heart attacks. I'm not intending to do that today. But 
uh, it's hydration. So it's continuous, continuous monitoring of hydration. Now, hydration is a big issue. In short, as we dehydrate, our brain shrinks, and you might not be surprised to hear that as our brain shrinks, that leads to a, a drop in our brain function. And there's many areas where that creates massive problems, and the way that hydration is currently monitored is, is quite poor. So this is an example, I'll take a readout. And what we have here is a real-time readout of my hydration level. And what we've done there is the thing that you can't see, of course, is what's under the skin. So we've monitored a key layer, just the hairs within the skin, that's most sensitive to hydration. So it's a real functional readout of hydration. As I said before, there's much work to be done. But this is what you would see if you took a slice of my skin and, uh, and looked at it under a microscope. So this is real data of our structures just going that outer layer of the skin where the, the signals are that matter the most. Now, if I turn my attention back to the heart attack example, uh, this is our approach in doing that. So again, the micro wearable goes into the skin. But what we do here is, is there's a protein that's released when a heart attack takes place. As heart tissue dies, there's a protein that goes into the blood. It's called troponin. And it's one of many uh, chemicals that are released into the blood. So that moves around uh, within the skin as well. Now, the way we detect that is we put a chemistry on the surface of these projections, and it's a type of aptima chemistry. Now, I won't go into aptima chemistry 101 today, but I will say the best way to think of it is a type of Lego that only clicks for that particular protein and that protein only. And when that clicking takes place, it leads to a signal uh, that's generated. And this is real data that's generated by my team. And here, what we're doing is we're measuring troponin, not in the live animal, but in, on a bench setting, but simulating a particular heart attack, and it's showing the rise in troponin through a heart attack setting. And it has the specificity and the sensitivity that's of clinical relevance for the detection of a heart attack in real time. So we're very excited about this particular data. Now, if I take a step back and talk about the field in general, so wearables and precision medicine, it's moving at a great speed, and this kind of work is new. And just like any new endeavor, there's many challenges that we need to overcome. And here are just a few of those. Uh, so the first is technical. Uh, we're doing something that hasn't been done before. And what goes with that is challenges that need to be overcome. Also, we're stressing uh, some boundaries of regulatory authorities. Like, How do they deal with this? Is it a medical device? Is it a health tech device? How do we move with that? So that's a challenge that we're working with the regulatory authorities on. And of course, the data that's generated. How is that done securely? How do we maintain trust uh, with the particular patients and the consumers? These are all important challenges. But if I wrap up, uh, so this is the picture that I'd like to see uh, in, in the future, where we're functional, we're alive, and we're well. And I'm convinced that wearables and precision medicine, we're only just seeing the beginning of what's taking place uh, within this space. As part of that, within just a handful of years, there will be minimally invasive wearable sensors that will have the ability to detect uh, key biomarkers that matter in real time. Now, that's a real step change forward in how medicine uh, will get done in that endeavor of the right medicine at the right place at the right time, but also now in real time. And so if we go back to the heart attack, so that should open up a scenario where heart attacks will become rare, but it's not just heart attacks, there's other key treatments that have been difficult to uh, administer or do. We, we'll, it'll take that to another level. And it'll be about time. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. With the next talk, we want to stay with uh, wearable devices. For the Sparks podcast, I interviewed Michael Snyder. He runs a lab at Stanford University, and the uh, discussion was taking place on Zoom, and I noticed he was wearing on both his wrists several devices. And I asked him, and he said, well, I wear up to eight a day. Now, <coughs> it's a bit of an extreme case, but many people do already wear devices that monitor uh, some of the functions of our body. And once we have all those devices and sensors in place and the flows of data that come out of that, what does that data tell us? Uh, maybe it can help us stay healthy, maybe it can help us age better. So our next speaker is one of uh, Snyder's uh, collaborators. Uh, she's a precision medicine and mental health researcher. Uh, 
please welcome Ariel Gantz. What is a healthy human temperature? How many of you think that a healthy human temperature is 37 degrees centigrade or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit? Okay, yes. For those of you who didn't vote, this is a trick question because it turns out that although this is a simple insight that we learned in school, growing up, at the doctor, this is something many of us have never questioned, and yet it's not true. In fact, each person has their own healthy baseline, and there is a dynamic range of temperatures that are healthy. For example, you might have a healthy baseline of 98.6. My healthy baseline is 97.3. So by the time I go to the doctor with a temperature of 98.6, that could be a fever for me. And you can see how this averaging and generalizing of our health that we've done for many years in medicine can lead to misdiagnosis or underdiagnosis. Traditionally, medicine has measured dozens of things, primarily in people when they are sick at the doctor. Our lab at Stanford, the Snyder Lab, takes a very different approach. We measure millions of things, primarily while people are healthy and even at home. And we do this frequently and in some cases continuously. We measure social connections, genomes, and also functional indicators of health, like how you're using your DNA and transcribing it into RNA, which is called transcriptomics proteins, metabolites, microbiome, epigenetics, and also the exposome, which is the collective exposures of diet, lifestyle, stress, toxins, and other, uh, for example, biological pathogens you're exposed to in your day-to-day -day life. This deep profiling continuously allows us to establish a healthy baseline for each person. And by establishing your own personal health baseline, we can identify the right treatments for the right people at the right time. And the reason I said the right treatments instead of the right medicine is because precision health and healthy baseline profiling actually allow us to go beyond reactively treating disease to proactively preventing disease and proactively improving health and potentially even improving aging. So we did this strategy in 109 people over eight and a half years in the Snyder Lab. We identified 49 major actionable health discoveries. And these were across a range of different conditions, including prediabetes, diabetes, cardiovascular events, stroke, and even cancer. And many of these were years ahead of clinical detection. Early detection can save lives. Many people are needlessly dying, for example, from heart attacks, say walking down the street. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer on our planet. And yet, in many cases, it's preventable. For example, something as simple as taking an aspirin, if there's enough notice that it's happening. In addition to multiomic profiling, we're also using wearable devices that continuously monitor people over time to predict and prevent disease, including infection. Early detection, especially in a pandemic, can save not only individual lives, but also community lives. We were able, with 80% accuracy, to detect COVID-19 on average three days ahead of when people felt sick or had symptoms, using Fitbits, Apple Watches, Aura Rings, and other wearables. And we did this in 5,000 patients. And this is important because COVID is an infectious disease that is infectious pre-symptomatically, before people know that they're sick. So in our case, we have a real-time alerting system that can actually tell someone 
that we may have detected COVID in them based on their wearable device. And this is based on, for example, heart rate. In this case, someone can then choose to not see their grandmother, to not go to a baby shower, whatever it is. And they can actually protect not only themselves, but the people around them. A major discovery in our lab using multi-omic profiling has been that different people age differently. We know that there are certain clinical markers that tend to be higher in older populations, for example, cholesterol. But again, we wanted to understand beyond the population level, on an individual level, how people are aging. Researchers in our lab tracked 43 healthy humans of varying ages for five years using deep multiomic profiling. What we found was that there are four major categories of agers within our cohort, and we call these ageotypes. Immunity agers, liver agers, kidney agers, and metabolic agers. And this is maybe not surprising. So if I have 100 cars, each one of you in this room has a car, <laughs> I can imagine that one car might have the engine go out first, one car might have the transmission go out first, one car might have the battery go out first. Just like cars, humans also have different organs and different systems that are aging at different rates. And this is also in part because we're using them differently. By understanding our own personalized aging profiles, we can again develop the right treatments for the right person at the right time to not only prevent aging, but potentially to even reverse it. This particular study was done over a two year period, which is important because that's an actionable period of time. And we actually saw that there were several people in our cohort who utilized lifestyle strategies like diet, weight loss, and exercise that had a slowed aging profile. As you can see, different people have different aging profiles, and that continues in terms of which specific molecules are most correlated with each person's aging. So on the left, person one has two different molecules here that are correlated with aging. This person's a metabolic kidney and liver ager. And on the right, person two was categorized as a cardiovascular ager. When we think about aging and longevity and health, we can measure the body all day, but the mind is also as important as the body. In fact, observational research shows us that social relationships are the number one predictor of longevity after midlife. In fact, depression and stress are known to accelerate epigenetic aging, and serious childhood adversity and trauma reduce life expectancy by 20 years. How does this happen? Well, one way that it happens is that our thoughts actually change the way that we use our DNA. Our thoughts and our beliefs actually drive physiological changes. So for example, if I have an environment, like I'm standing with my boss in his office and I believe you know, he asks me, how are you doing? I can think, my boss wants to help. So that's in the green here. So that would be a non-threat belief. Or I could think, he doesn't like me, my work isn't good enough. That's a threat belief. And this activates a whole downstream fight or flight pathway that can be activated by social threat and our repeated belief about the situation. So again, it's just by what I'm thinking that can actually change gene expression in, for example, immune cells and drive inflammatory processes. Given the importance of mental health and psychosocial factors in aging, our lab wanted to understand how we can improve mental fitness and how this relates to aging and metabolism. Currently, we're in a mental health crisis. One in five Americans are suffering with mental health, 
the treatments are not working well. If you read the news, <laughs> you can see that every headline is talking about how, you know, for example, the serotonin hypothesis is not what we thought, and only 30% of people are getting better from antidepressant drugs. In addition, many people are unable to access therapy. Even 96% of Wyoming is said to live in a healthcare shortage area. For this reason, our lab wanted to understand what are highly scalable mental fitness practices that can improve psychosocial outcomes and potentially even aging. We evaluated two immersive programs. The first is a nine-day uh, School for the Work of Byron Katie, which is an inquiry-based stress reduction program. And the second was a six-day uh, Tony Robbins retreat Date with Destiny, which integrates multiple practices known to improve psychosocial outcomes, including gratitude, exercise, um, value reframing, meditation, and hypnosis. Our results were astounding. We saw, so here in the gray uh, are traditional therapies, and you can see that they are associated with a 65% or less reduction in depression score across the literature. Our results in the red showed an 82 to 86% reduction in depression scores. And more importantly, when we looked at what percentage of people actually convert from being known as clinically depressed to no longer depressed, Actually, 90 to 100 percent of our participants recovered from depression and also maintained that recovery for 14 plus months. And this is two to three times better than the standard of care. It's also twice as powerful as psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which currently has uh, FDA uh, breakthrough classification for major depressive disorder. More importantly, we also saw that positive psychosocial outcomes improved, including relationships, meaning, hope, life satisfaction, and well-being. Sorry, I want to add one thing. And the next step on this is asking, do these programs that improve psychosocial well-being and improve mental health do they also improve aging as well as personalized aging profiles? And even can they reverse biological aging? Medicine of the past has been focused on illness. It's been reactive, measuring few things, infrequent, and it characterizes us on a population basis. Medicine of the future, precision health, is proactive, focused on well-being, measures many things, and is individual-based. We all want to live happy, healthy, and connected lives. Every single human being on the planet wants to experience good health care. By combining multiomic longitudinal profiling, mental fitness, and personalized aging patterns, we can understand individuals aging and their individual's health, and we can identify the right treatments for the right people at the right time to improve well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Avio. Thank you, Avio, thank you. Okay, let's take a moment to imagine what happens if everybody wears several uh, devices. Uh, add that to the data that we're already accumulating through all the different data gathering systems we already have everywhere in the health system, and that's, of course, a staggering amount of data in a constant flow. Uh, a lot of data we have now actually sits in silos, so that's an additional problem. How do we bring them together? How can scientists manage that data and share it better, make it more accessible? This organization is trying to figure that out. It's the European Bioinformatics Institute. It's an international organization, it's innovative, it's interdisciplinary, it's also a big champion of uh, open data in life sciences. And our next speaker is one of the co-directors of the institute, Rolf Abweiler. We asked him to talk about the opportunities and challenges of large-scale bioinformatics. Uh, Please welcome Rolf Abweiler.
Yeah, hello everyone. That will be a really hard act to follow after so many great talks today. So, but I hope I will give you also a nice insight into what I call the bioinformatics revolution. And the bioinformatics revolution we already see, because we have had over the last years seen the analysis of genomes of humans and pathogens, especially in the pandemic. Um, we heard already about better imaging and detection at hospitals. We heard about long-term um, observations of individuals and digitalizations of such observations. Wearables, we just heard a great talk about that. And, uh, and we will later on hear a great talk about an artificial intelligence, about AlphaFold. Um, and my area is more involved with dealing with the large-scale measurements and analysis of proteins and small molecules and how to analyze this data and put that into context. And all of that has together uh, the feature that really the data is in the middle of everything now. So if you look now at a scientific publication, it gives a snapshot of the data which was gathered and the analysis you can do. The data was at this time gathered for a certain purpose. But very often we have now this approaches of omics and bioinformatics in the, clin uh, in the uh, research setting to more of a clinical setting. So we want to move, um, bioinformatics really deals um, with, well, the, the data analysis in the, in the health setting will help us hopefully to make early diagnosis, more precise diagnosis, more effective treatment, fewer adverse reactions, uh, and prognostics and preventive approaches. And for, for all of that, to help with that, we need to have bioinformatics, because all, all of these technologies create incredible amounts of data, and we need to uh, figure out what it means. Bioinf Bioinformatics is still a relatively new field and a diverse field. It builds the interface between computer science and biology and really aims to develop methods and software tools for understanding biological data, in particular uh, large and complex omics data sets. And one of the newest examples you will later on hear uh, about the Human Cell Atlas. So, in driven um, is this revolution of bioinformatics really b with the development of omics technologies. We heard already a bit about that. It's genomics, it's proteomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, and there are a lot of other omics, and especially the Snyder Lab uh, is driving that a lot into other omics too. Um, so that there's another thing which is really important, which made a huge difference in moving uh, all of these omics technologies and bioinformatics in a way that it was driving the development of molecular biology, of biology, of life sciences, and nowadays also of clinical research and very soon even more of healthcare. And that is one of the reasons for that is what you have in molecular biology an open data uh, cycle. So scientists generate data based on uh, their experiments and make discoveries, but they deposit then their data latest at the time of publication with places like us, Emble EBI, and we then archive this, but not only this, we share it with global collaborators and all scientists in the world, actually with everyone interested, because all of this data is open. We classify, enrich, combine and analyze the data. We distribute both the raw and the so-called value-added data resources. Again, this is then uh, used by scientists to come up with new hypotheses, design new experiments based on the shared global knowledge, and the cycle starts again. When I started in the late 80s in this field, we had around 400 users in, in the whole world who were using our data, and we shipped it on big tapes to them. Nowadays, we have hun more than 100 million daily web requests to our uh, websites from more than 40 million different uh, internet protocol addresses per year. Every five minutes, an article is published which cites Amble EBI data resources. And we receive every three seconds a new data set. So that ha has, for that we need right now something like 400, 500 petabytes of, of disks. So this is really a huge change, but I still think this is only the beginning because we are now moving out of the research space into the application space. So if you look at this map behind me there, then the red dots show all the countries which have clinical research cohorts. That means 
uh, in this cohorts, um, a whole genome sequencing project has been started. So all of these cohorts, all the individuals get sequenced. That's still clinical research. The more interesting is are the green colors, because that are all the countries which have now already initiated or are planning a healthcare-based whole genome sequencing project. Medic real medical genomes for diagnostics and uh, um, um, uh, therapeutics. And again, uh, bioinformatics and the omics technologies are central in, in analyzing, uh, in, in driving this, this forward. So I will give you one example from the UK uh, based on the Genomics England experience. Genomics England is uh, part of the national health system and is doing whole genome sequencing mainly of uh, uh, children with rare diseases and of ca cancer patients. So there are around 600,000 births a year in the UK and 2% of the, um, the children present with a suspected genetic congenital uh, phenotype where genome sequencing is then approved within six months of birth. So this is standard practice, yeah? So I'm not saying that is tomorrow, that is now, really now. That means you have around 12,000 uh, uh, probands per year. And since you usually sequence not only the child, but also both parents, if and, and sometimes not both, pa both parents are not available. So you talk about something like 25,000 genomes per year. And the, for in 25 to 30% of these cases, you can make now a diagnosis, which you couldn't have done without sequencing. And that is having an, an immense, immense impact. The diagnosis leads to 50% less hospital visits on average, 25% of the time immediate change of clinical practice, in 5% of the patients, it has really a large transformative impact on care. There are also these effects that the families are now able to make better informed choices for future uh, uh, children. Because one of the surprising results was that a lot of these mutations were not inherited. They were, uh, they were happening de novo. And that means when the, when the parents have planned another child, there's very uh, little chance that this would happen again. And then there's also the psychological effect that families and th uh, the patients and clinicians have closure of that because they don't need to carry on with the odyssey of, of uh, visiting one doctor after the other for, uh, um, for uh, diagnosis and, and, um, and treatment. There's also the side effect, which is incredibly important, that 85% of the families or, pa or patients consent to use the data for ongoing research. That helps them directly, because by reanalysis of the cohorts, in the light of new knowledge, may give additional diagnosis uh, of the ones which were not diagnosed, or better diagnosis of the ones which were diagnosed. And they can be also contacted for, uh, to for uh, participating in trials and clinical studies. So that sounds great. Why, why, where's the problem? Um, yeah, there are still some problems. I mean, you just mentioned that before in your talk, um, um, there, there are quite a few challenges to roll things out uh, globally. So one thing are technical challenges. And then I give you one, one simple example. Let's say you are a researcher and you're interested in bowel disease, and you want to find all the data sets out there which are uh, patient-based and uh, in, in databases, yeah, where you can get access to. First, how do you find them? Yeah? So that's already one problem, the discovery. Then if you find them, you find 50 data sets in 30 databases in 20 countries. How do you authenticate yourself? How do you get authorization by all the different data access committees? And if you have all of that, then you can't just download the data. You need to bring your analysis tools to the data. And all of them, or many of them, have different setups. So you need to massage then the data before you can do something with it. And there's one group, one yeah, huge group of community, the so-called Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, both academics and industry, which work together on open standards to solve all of these problems. And I think here we are in really good shape because we have a community effort which works and is shaping the, the, the open standards of the future. But there are also other challenges. And they are, again, 
one a few talks before we heard already a bit about that there are some global and some country specific challenges there are the challenges of the pricing there's a, a lot of ch a huge challenge is how we tr build trust to patients how to discuss the right of benefit b versus the right of privacy how do we educate um, uh, people, how do you do the right outreach to raise awareness and show the benefits of what's in there for precision medicine, genomic medicine. We have a lack of infrastructure, of shared open infrastructure. We, have, we are attacking with the Global Alliance of Genomics and Health already standards and QA and such things, but we also need a lot of people. We need skills, we need more training. Um, and now I think comes really the most important thing, as I mentioned before, the success of modern biology is driven by the open data ethos. And in the healthcare system, you have a very close data mentality. And that drives costs and speed, uh, well, drives cost and slows speed. So I think this is something we need to change. There are also some country specific challenges, but we can overcome them, like different approaches on regulations, ethics, the different trust in companies versus the state. We heard that already today before. And of course, here we all speak English in the research setting. This is not the case in the healthcare setting. There are local languages. Again, you need to have standard vocabulary, which uh, uh, translates the national form of um, uh, language into a global uh, um, uh, system which is open that we can all use it without paying license fees all of that and there are many many more uh, uh, things to talk about but i really want to stop there and just say we all need to work together on these things we all need to work together to build trust in the communities. We all need to raise awareness and show the benefits of open data for the society and the individual. I think we all need to cooperate globally on infrastructure standards and skills. We need to federate systems globally while respecting that there are different approaches on regulation and ethics. We will not change that. We want to make it also not only useful for rich countries. A lot of what we talked about here can happen in rich countries, but how do we make that available worldwide? And how do we embed that in a different approach to healthcare? That we look at a one health approach. It's not only humans, it's animal health and it's biodiversity, the environment, that all fits together and works together. And we can't have just a reductionist view there, we need to have a global view. And I think all of us can be part of making that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. One of the big challenges in uh, biology is the shape of proteins. There are hundreds of millions of them. They come in all shapes, very convoluted ones. Uh, and researchers used to spend like entire careers just trying to figure out and predict the shape of a handful of them. And then artificial intelligence came into the picture. And uh, now we can predict the shape of almost all proteins known to science. And there is one specific company behind that feat, which is broadly recognized as a real breakthrough in uh, biology. And it's DeepMind, which is a sister company to uh, Google and has been using a specific machine learning system called AlphaFold. Uh, Ankur Vora is a public engagement expert at DeepMind, is our next uh, speaker. And he's here to tell us about AlphaFold, but also about using AI in science. Ankur, the stage is yours. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me here today. It's a real honor. So I want to talk to you today about how artificial intelligence can help us advance science and in doing so help improve health and well-being. And in 10 minutes I'm hoping to cover quite a lot. We're going to talk about proteins, computational biology, artificial intelligence, art, and at some point I'm even going to touch on ships and seas. And in the interest of transparency, I also want to mention some of the things that I won't be covering today, some of my favorite things. So I won't be talking about the greatest football team in the world, Liverpool FC, I won't be talking about the greatest food, cookies, and I won't be talking about the greatest band, Radiohead. So if you're disappointed and want to leave now, I totally understand. Now, 
our story starts, as many of mine do, with me procrastinating. Because as I was preparing for this talk, I became engrossed in recent developments in AI image generation, which had prompted renewed debate about the nature and the meaning of art. Now, what is art is a fascinating question, and one that, thankfully, I'm not actually here today to answer. But from watching this debate unfold, I took away two things. Firstly, that art is in the eye of the beholder, and secondly, that context really matters. And so I wanted to start today by sharing you an image of something that I've come to consider as art. This is protein by the artist most commonly known as nature, and I think this is a wonderful image for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, it depicts one of life's building blocks. Proteins underpin every biological process in every living thing, and they're found everywhere, from the skeletons and cells that we're made up of, to the plants that we eat, from the bacteria and viruses that cause disease to the antibodies that help us tackle those diseases. Proteins are basically essential to life as we know it. Secondly, this image starts to give you a sense of what intricate, exquisite biological machines proteins are and how the three-dimensional structure that you see here might determine the protein's function. For example, this protein is part of the nuclear pore complex, one of the largest molecular machines in cells, made up of around 1,000 protein subunits. And as you can perhaps get a better sense of here, this complex acts as a gatekeeper for everything that goes in and out of the nucleus in the cell, as well as organizing some essential cellular processes, such as transcription and ribosome assembly. And this range of roles means that the nuclear pore complex is thought to be increasingly involved in a growing number of diseases, including neurodegenerative ones, such as ALS and Parkinson's. And this idea that the structure of a protein determines its function actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Think about antibodies, which have a site that is designed like a lock to bind to a specific molecular structure, its key, as it were. Or take collagen proteins that are shaped like cords and transmit tension across cartilage, ligaments, tendons, and bones. And this applies even outside of biology. Think about something like a chair, right? The structure of a chair determines how you use it. If it's wide and big, you might sit back in it. If it's got a really good backrest and it's ergonomic, it's something that you can work from. If it's like tall, then it might be a bar stool. And so knowing how proteins are structured opens the door to better understanding their function, to better understanding how mutations and disease might affect that function, and to better discovering and maybe even designing drugs which interact with proteins. But determining this structure is a lot easier said than done. See, proteins are made up of a sequence of amino acids. You can think of this as its list of ingredients, as it were. And in nature, the sequence of residues falls spontaneously, often in milliseconds, into these intricate 3D structures that we see. Now, you can determine this structure experimentally, and indeed, that's pretty much the gold standard. But it can take a lot of time. As Bruno mentioned, sometimes people will spend an entire PhD trying to determine a single structure. And it can take a lot of expensive equipment, sometimes on the order of millions of dollars. And so you had this situation where, as of at least a year ago or so, um, of the roughly 200 million protein sequences that we knew of, we had experimentally determined the structure for around 200,000 of those. And so there's this huge opportunity there. Now, as the Nobel laureate Christian Anfinsen suggested in his acceptance speech around 50 years ago, we should be able to fully determine the tertiary structure of a protein from its primary structure, that sequence of amino acids. It's just really hard to do computationally. A scientist called Cyrus Leventhal in the 1960s showed that, on average, uh, an average protein might have 10 to the 300 possible conformations. And to put that into perspective, if you were to randomly enumerate through each of those conformations in order to try and find the right one, it would take you longer than the age of the universe. And so solving this protein folding problem, being able to accurately predict scale um, what 3D structure a particular sequence of amino acids might take on has been this 50-year-old grand challenge in biology. And it's the kind of grand challenge that we really relish at DeepMind, because it's one where AI can help us turn this abundance of information into understanding. It can help us deepen the nature of the questions that scientists can ask. And it can help us unlock and advance numerous avenues of research across health, pure science, sustainability, and more. So how did DeepMind use AI to provide a solution to this ch grand challenge? Well, I'm not going to go into too many details today. For those of you who are interested, we've open-sourced our code. We've also published our methods in nature alongside 60 pages of supplementary information, which gives you some sense of just how complicated a system this is. But in short, protein folding is far too complex a phenomenon for us to be able to explicitly program a system with rules 
uh, to determine how a structure might be uh, formed. And so instead, what we require is a learning system, one that over time can optimize for finding and identifying this right structure and can expose patterns in this data that is intractable for humans. And by doing this, which, by the way, required multiple critical innovations in AI, required an in incredible interdisciplinary team, years of hard work, building on the efforts of many incredible scientists and institutions, and we developed this system called AlphaFold. And we entered that system into this wonderful community-led blind assessment for predicting protein structures called CASP, the critical assessment for uh, the prediction of protein structures. I probably got that wrong. <laughs> and through this assessment, we were able to independently confirm that AlphaFold could indeed predict the shape of a protein down to atomic accuracy at scale and in minutes. And as you can see here, the predictions in blue are very close to the ground truth in green. And this makes these predictions comparable to uh, experimental methods and therefore widely useful in practice. And so what did we do with these predictions? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we were aware that a breakthrough like the um, AlphaFold could have widespread and varied downstream implications for a number of avenues of research. And so to maximize the scientific impact and the eventual benefit to humanity of this, we decided to partner with the brilliant folks over at Ember EBI to develop this free and open resource available to all where anyone could input a protein sequence or search for a protein and get back its predicted structure, just like you would for an internet search. And over the last year, that database has expanded from a few hundred thousand structures to, as of today, 200 million structures. So that's almost every catalog protein known to science. And as you can see on the left, that database has already been accessed in the last 18 months by over 750,000 scientists, over 190 countries, and Alfold itself has been cited in thousands of papers. Now, when we released these structures, we wanted to be very mindful of the ethical implications. We wanted to apply our operating principles that try and ensure that we maximize the benefit of AI whilst also mitigating its risks and its negative potential outcomes. And so to do this, we consulted with over 30 experts from biosecurity, bioethics, human rights, and more to inform our release strategy. For example, we found that it's actually uh, clear that AlphaFold itself would not make it meaningfully easier to cause harm with proteins because there are many other practical barriers to doing so. And so providing free and widespread access was the best way of delivering benefit at this time. It also helped confirm our view that we needed to provide some kind of confidence metric with AlphaFold's outputs because it's not able to predict the, pr uh, the structure of a protein accurately in all cases. Indeed, many cases it doesn't. And so we wanted to make sure that scientists had this way of determining which parts of prediction uh, the model had high confidence in, which parts they should use, which parts might be able to complement some of their existing experimental data, and so on. And so how has AlphaFold been used so far? We've been really inspired to see some of the examples of what AlphaFold is being used for in the community. There's a group at the University of Oxford who are using AlphaFold to study the, a protein that is essential to the development of the malaria parasite in mosquitoes. And understanding the structure of this protein could help us develop a more effective vaccine. There's the Drugs for Neglected Diseases initiative that was mentioned earlier, who we partnered with to help speed up the discovery of new treatments into fatal parasitic illnesses, such as leishmaniasis. Then it's also helped, as I mentioned earlier, unveil more of this nuclear pore complex, which we hadn't actually experimentally determined a large, um, a large part of the proteins for. And in doing so, that might help uh, us understand far more diseases, given the essential and varied role that nuclear pore complex plays in cells. And a group at the University of Colorado Boulder are using AlphaFold to help understand the structures of these enzymes that are actually involved in the mechanism that creates resistance to antibiotics. These are just a few examples of the ways in which AI is transforming the way scientists conduct research and accelerating progress across a wide range of applications. And I think it means that it ushers in a new era of hopefully digital biology or computational biology and also a new era of scientific discovery. And so to give you a little sense of how at least I think about that, I wanted to end with one more piece of art. And what I want you to do is I want you to picture this vast and immense sea which has many islands of knowledge scattered amongst it. 
and we explore the sea using science. And to date, we've been doing that exploration in the equivalent of rowboats. And that's not to undermine what we discovered, quite the opposite. It's through human creativity, ingenuity, endeavor, and perseverance and curiosity that we've actually been able to discover so much that has dramatically improved health outcomes and well-being across the world. But if we move from rowboats to something like sailboats and we harness the technology of sails, we were able to travel so much further across real seas. And in fact, this image depicts the voyage of the Beagle, the ship that Charles Darwin went on as he first started to hypothesize and uh, develop his theory of evolution by natural selection. And in the same way, I hope that AI can transform how we explore these seas, how we discover new islands of knowledge, and they can assist us to go further, to go quicker with more people on board and advance human curiosity and creativity. And if we work collaboratively, if we make sure to be mindful of safety, responsibility, and equity, then what we discover using AI could not only involve, uh, advance science, but in doing so, it could also lead us to dramatically improve human health and well-being across the world for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ankur. And we're going to stay with the topic of uh, collaboration. Of course, collaboration in science was already a real thing at the time of Darwin, but it was very small scale uh, and probably random at some, at some level. Uh, now we have this huge large scale collaboration. CERN is a good example of it. We have heard before about the Human Genome Project uh, and the Human Immunome uh, Project. One 20 years ago, the other just starting today. We're going to look at another huge global collaboration, the Human Cell Atlas. And joining us for that is a leading member of the Human Cell Atlas uh, Initiative. The senior, she's a senior clinical research fellow at the Welcome Sanger Institute. Please welcome Mas Anifa. Hello, everyone. Um, it's fantastic hearing all of these um, exciting innovations for the advancement of uh, human health. I'm going to talk about the Human Cell Atlas, uh, and just to put a bit of context into why this work is needed. Humans have constantly, you know, mapped scientific frontiers in the world that they live in, the universe all the way to the atom, and CERN being one of the amazing organizations that's doing just that. And there are, but there are still the magic and mysteries uh, of the human body that we still do not know. And one of the major milestones in our understanding of the human body was the Human Genome Project, um, you know, more than 20 years ago now, where researchers from across the world, uh, funded through public and private initiatives, using cutting-edge techniques at that time, which was to sequence the human DNA, provided the first blueprint of the human genome. And that blueprint has really advanced many under so much understanding of our lives and also advanced medicine. And this blueprint encodes our cells, which comes to what exactly are the cells of the human body. And you've heard earlier, we actually don't know how many cell types there are in the human body. There are 37 trillion cells. And a specific segment of that blueprint, our genetic blueprint, is activated in each cell that gives it its identity. That is why the eye cells become eye cells and the muscle cells are muscle cells. And the genetic blueprint also accounts for the traits, the functional differences of those cells. So really to understand the human body, the next step is we need to map the human cells. And it's a bit like having a Google map of the human body. And you can see that the views are extremely different from a satellite view, what you would see as the body, to a kind of country or continental view of the organ, uh, a much more sort of regional view, which is the tissue, a component of the organ which is specialized, and also the street level, the cell and its molecular information. And that ability for us to actually map every cell in the human body has really been sparked and accelerated by technology revolution. And there are two approaches to doing this. One is applying um, single cell genomics, whereby you take tissue and then you break the tissue apart into the individual cells, and then you look at the gene expression of those individual cells. And it gives you, uh, and, and the gene expression then gives you the cell identity. So this is like a census, a parts list of what makes up the tissue, what makes up the organ. 
Another way is to look at the gene expression at very high resolution at the tissue or even the organ level. And this gives you the information of where the cells are, who their neighbors are, how the cells are communicating. And so this location information, which if you put together with the census information, gives you an extremely unprecedented resolution and insight into how the human body is made and um, established. So this is really the mission of the Human Cell Atlas, uh, to provide a comprehensive map of human cells using cutting edge single cell omics technologies. Why? Really to understand health, what, what maintains health, and what goes, ro goes wrong, and how can we prevent things from going wrong, and how can we treat diseases moving forwards. So it began about 2016 uh, with the realization that it wasn't going to take one lab, it wasn't going to take a village, it was going to take the entire world. And so this international consortium was launched by Sarah Teichman at the Wellcome Sanger Institute and also Aviv Regev, who was at the Broad Institute then, but now at Genentech. And this was the small group of people who came uh, and, and gathered together, bringing interdisciplinary expertise, clinicians, computer scientists, biologists, engineers, chemists, all saying how can we bring all of our expertise together to find out what exactly is the human body uh, made of. And here we are now in 2022. It is indeed taking the world to build this. There are more than 2,000 members and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the framework and how this is um, executed at ground level. Firstly, it's a networking science, so there are kind of um, networks that we've defined uh, for various body areas and also systems. Um, and these networks have coordinators who then work with other researchers and trying to sort of coordinate sharing knowledge, sharing technology expertise, looking at how we can analyze the data in a very kind of a systematic and aligned manner. And all of this is supported by working groups, ethics. We've heard about how different countries may have different ethical regulation, equity. How do we make sure that actually this is going to be an inclusive and representative atlas of the different people in the world? How do we analyze the data? so that we can actually make sense of, of you know, uh, real sense uh, of, of all the integrated uh, uh, data sets and also standards and technologies. What are the best cutting edge methods that we should be using right now? So it's a flat and democratic structure, very much decentralized. So it's not where one center is doing all of the data generation or one center doing all of the data analysis. Uh, this is trying to kind of like build expertise, regional groupings, uh, collaborative and inclusive, and as I mentioned, global. So you have the Human Cell Atlas South America, uh, Human Cell Atlas Asia networks. But fundamentally, it's open science. Open science from the perspective of sharing the data very early on, open science in the form of sharing expertise very early on, and open science in terms of what do we want to get out of the data? Because the framework of how you work and the infrastructure that you need is very different when you want to build a skyscraper compared to a garden shed. And the Human Cell Atlas is one that's where you're building a skyscraper. And, and, and as I said, to understand health, prevent and treat disease. And I'll give you one exemplar of how the knowledge that we've gained so far from profiling the cells of the human body has really ad advanced our understanding, primarily during the pandemic. So we know that coronavirus needs to enter the cells to infect the cells. And therefore, it needs to bind to receptors uh, that it can recognize on the cells. And the, the receptor is primarily ACE2. So what you could do as a community, having profiled all of the cells in the human body, is come together, put all of your published and unpublished data together, and particularly led by the Human Cell Atlas Lung Network to ask where are the receptors in the human body and where are the vulnerable sites for infection uh, in this context. So where exactly is ACE2 in healthy tissues? With the ATLAS data set, we can look at the expression of ACE2 and, and, and its co-receptors. And what you find is that it is most highly expressed in the nasal cavity, but also in the oral cavity, but also in the conjunctiva and the cornea, not just in the lung. So all of these areas where you may need protection, wearing mask and perhaps eye protection. So where exactly is the Human Cell Atlas now in terms of progress and what will it deliver? 
So this is um, just the networks together and looking at how many individuals, about 10,000 individuals as of this year, how many uh, tissue samples that have been profiled and how many cells, and really coming to a more than 10 billion cells, which is a massive uh, advance since its inception in 2016. And, and the next question will be uh, what do we actually will provide for, for the world? And what we aim to provide is like a periodic table of cells in the way that you know, the periodic table of uh, different um, molecules had been done in the you know, uh, early century. So, um, and with this, this is going to really be able to tell us how the you know, cells assembled together, the building blocks that make the different tissues, the different organs, and also how we can then use this information, the wealth of data behind it, uh, in a way that will allow many, many researchers, many people around the world to actually gain the most benefit from these data sets in the form of like a web browser, for example, that anyone can access. And we've all talked about how we, can, how we need to work together, how we should work together. And sometimes I think the question needs to, to be asked is, why aren't we working together more effectively? And perhaps that's a, a focus area uh, for, for the discussion tomorrow. So I'm going to um, stop here and to thank you for your attention um, and, and hope you will find out more about the Human Cell Atlas. Thank you, Miss. Thank you. So we've covered a lot today. We have talked about cancer, mental health, immunology, sensors and wearables, aging, viruses, protein cells, artificial intelligence, the economics of health, and much more. So we're going to take a short break, but it's a video break. Uh, it's a video break about looking at health technology through the eyes of an artist. Uh, Amy Carl is an artist who collaborates with scientists and technologists. And, uh, in a period of her career, she was a, a resident, an artist in residence at Pier 9 in San Francisco, which is owned by Autodesk. Now, Autodesk is a company that develops software for engineering, construction, architecture. You take that kind of software and you put it together with 3D printing and you give it to an artist and this is what you get. Bones, to me, represent both life and death. The form and inherent design of bones are so beautiful and exquisite. They tell a story about what they do and the structure that they hold. But on their own, when they're separated from that structure, they're very intriguing of how did this shape come to be. We generally think of bones as rigid because we see the bones that are left after death. But bones are actually really dynamic, living things that continue to grow and take form because of the forces that are put upon them. I've always used the body in my artwork. I'm very inspired by our natural biology, as well as our emotional content. Sharing what it means to be human is a deeply personal and deeply emotional expression. I was studying bones and making artwork inspired by bones, and I started thinking about concepts in generative art and systems that grow and generate on their own. And kind of merging those two inspirations at the same time, I came to this idea of actually growing bone. As an artist in residence at Pier 9, I found out that we have a bio nano lab here and scientists that are working in bone and collagen. So we collaborated and embarked on this process of 3D printing lattices for cell growth. I 3D scanned a hand bone of a female hand that was about the same size as me. And then we took that 3D scan data, processed it, and brought it into a 3D modeling environment. Once I refined that design, I used a program called Within Medical to break this geometry down to the cellular level in a trabecular structure. The trabecular structure is the spongy part of bone. Stem cells have an intelligence that programs them to be able to come the type of cell that they need to be. If I put them onto a lattice that's shaped like bone, then they will become bone. 
I 3D printed the micro lattice on the Ember 3D printer. The material I used is a PEGDA hydrogel that's used to grow cells. It's biocompatible and biodegradable. So over time, the hydrogel disintegrates. After the micro lattices were 3D printed, we seeded them with human stem cells and allowed them to grow. So the intention is that I made this lattice to guide the cells a form to grow into, but we don't really know if it's gonna grow into that form or if it's gonna proliferate outwards and do something more interesting. To me, there's so much awe and mystery in the way that life is formed. It's an intelligence beyond our understanding for all these parts to come together in perfect union. I created this as a piece of artwork, but in the future, we could potentially use the same method to make bone grafts that are implantable into the body. And if we're going to be implanting back into the body, what does that mean? How would we redesign our bodies and what would we make ourselves into? As an artist and designer, it's also really interesting to consider what would we make if we no longer need to use inanimate objects like metal and fibers. If we can now use the building blocks of life, actual cells and tissue, what would we make? What would you make? Okay, we are at the closing talk for the day, but uh, just before doing that, let me say a few small uh, things, a few pieces of information. The recording of the whole event today is gonna be available on YouTube. If you want to share any part of it with your friends, that's where you're gonna find it on the CERN YouTube channels. The Spark podcast is also available on all the uh, classic uh, streaming services and that's also where you can find and share it. The third edition of Sparks is gonna be next year. It's gonna be, hopefully, at the new Gateway of Science, which is being built just behind us here. Uh, and it's gonna be inaugurated in uh, June. So watch out for an announcement about uh, uh, Sparks next, uh, next year. Now we're gonna end with a talk about right and wrong. There's the title of a book. Uh, that our closing speaker has published recently, Right, Wrong, How Technology Changes, Transforms Our Ethics. Now, most people, most of us, have uh, an intuitive understanding uh, nurtured by our education uh, on what's right and what's wrong. One thing we forget is that that dividing line moves over time, and often it moves because of technological innovation and the impacts of new technologies in our lives and in society. And when those technologies and that innovation is health-related, of course, ethics becomes a que central question. So let's hear how the author of that book frames the question. Please welcome Juan Enriquez. Okay, so it's been a great long day. You've seen great science, and so now I know what you're thinking. I need a really rousing ethics talk right now. <laughs> Of course, you've never heard an ethics talk. But as you're thinking about an ethics talk, it brings to mind the most boring human document ever written, which is the dreaded HR manual. Thou shall do this, thou shall not do that. And you've heard that a thousand times. And what I want to do instead of having a talk about that is I want to have a talk about adult themes. What happens when the rules change even if you're doing the right stuff? And let's start with the premise that some of this stuff is gonna bug you and trigger you, and I'm sorry. In that process, let's start with an advertisement, two advertisements, and let's start with the premise that if you are marketing, what you really wanna do is you wanna sell stuff and not really anger people. So why did people used to publish advertisements like this? That unacceptable advertisement, right? our rules have changed as to what's acceptable and what's not. 
And as you think about this stuff, one of the biggest single drivers of changing our notion of what's right and wrong has been technology. And the second thing is technology is becoming exponential. And that means that ethics may begin to change at exponential rates. And so what's the problem in a period where everybody thinks they're right and wrong? Well, the problem is that you have one wrong tweet, you wore one wrong costume a decade ago or a month ago, and you destroy a 30-year career because everybody's so damn right that they're willing to cancel you, but if the rules change, they might get canceled as well. So as you're thinking about this, if you don't believe me, let's talk about a topic which is sort of interesting, which is sex. Let's imagine that you want to talk to your grandpa and grandma about sex. So you're going to have a conversation about the birds and the bees. And what you're going to do is you're going to bring them back, not as these wonderful white-haired, gentle people. You're going to take a time machine. You're going to bring them back as hot 20-year-olds. <laughs> so you're sitting here in the cafeteria. You're having a chat about sex with grandpa and grandma. They knew a lot about sex. They were probably married in their 20s. What would seem a little strange to them? Well, the first thing would be, grandpa, grandma, we can now have all the sex we want and never have a child. Did they have birth control? Yes, it was only sold to those who were married. And it was frowned upon. Was it effective? No, it wasn't always effective. And now all of a sudden you've decoupled the act from the consequence. That would seem very strange. Then they'd scratch their heads and then they'd say, what's this IVF stuff you speak of? Well, grandpa, grandma, it turns out that we can take a sperm, we can take an egg, we can mix it together and conceive a child without two bodies ever physically coming in contact together. In fact, they don't have to be in the same room. They don't have to be in the same country. And you can conceive a child. And they'd say, well, you know what? We'd heard about that, and we used to call that the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> and we thought that was kind of a miracle, but that would, that would be a little odd to them. And then you've got this small matter of freezing eggs, freezing sperm, having a surrogate mother. And the consequence of that is you can have identical twins born 30 years apart. So all of a sudden, you've decoupled the act from the consequence, the act from physical contact, and the act from time. And that seems normal and natural to a lot of us, but it would have seemed absolutely weird, strange, and completely wrong to your grandparents. Now let's play the same experiment going forward. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put you in a time machine. Your grandchildren are now 70 years old. You come in at 20. Do you think sex and reproduction will look the same? And do you think your current notions of what is right and what is wrong are going to be the same in some time? As you begin to be able to bring animals to term without ever having to be in a body, you may change who and how babies are carried to term. And the incentive to intervene if you don't have to go through another body also increases. Which brings us to that small matter of editing babies, which has been a scandal. And it should be a scandal. This was done without the right review. It was done before the stuff was safe. It was done without any kind of adult supervision. But what happens to your grandkids? Can you conceive of a discussion with your grandkids in 50 years where they look at you and say, Grandpa, you suspicious old twonk horror. How in the world did you decide not to edit out my P53 gene, my KRAS gene, my BRCA gene? I've now got cancer because you were so superstitious, you didn't bother to edit my genome. Right, 180 degree flip. And if you don't think technology changes over time, then you don't believe that people used to perform human sacrifices to bring the rain or to bring up the sun. And you don't believe that the state used to think it was perfectly fine to burn people at the stake. Maybe not even that far from here. And of course, in the fanciest parts of Paris, they used to administer justice like this. And we look at these things and we say, how dare you have done that? But this was state sanctioned, this was religion sanctioned, this was sanctioned by those who wrote the rules. And most people thought this was right. And of course, now we look at it and say, you savages. Take one of the more controversial topics of the day, slavery. How in the hell did we allow slavery for hundreds of thousands of years in almost every civilization? The Incas, the Mayas, those gentle Swedes, everybody south of them was called the Slavs. 
right? Is there a civilization that you can come up with that did not practice slavery? And of course, that's how you got around. That's how you moved. Now, is it a complete coincidence that most slavery went away in legal, term, legal terms in developed countries in decades after hundreds of thousands of years? Or might it have something to do with the fact that five, a barrel of oil is the equivalent of five to 10 years of human labor? And when you tie that to thousands of horsepower, then those two jet engines that brought you here are the equivalent of 320,000 people rowing you here. You have different choices. You make different choices. And when you make different choices and you have technology, life expectancy explodes across the world after centuries of being flat. Wealth explodes across the world. And we don't have to enslave other human beings. Is it a complete coincidence that the first places to become abolitionists were the places that had the Industrial Revolution? Like England, like the Northern United States. Is it a complete coincidence that the places that today practice slavery are the places that are the least industrialized? That's not arguing there weren't incredibly brave abolitionists who put their lives on the line. That's not arguing that there weren't a lot of people who saw the wrong early, but the majority, whether they saw the wrong or not, practiced something which is absolutely a despicable thing for hundreds of thousands of years. When you think of ethics as ethereal, pristine, never changing, and you take the position, I'm wrong, and if you disagree with me, I will destroy your career, you're not taking into account that the rules can sometimes change across time, that technology is exponential, that these new technologies enable behaviors we couldn't before. So if technology changes ethics, and technology is exponential, and ethics changes at exponential rates, then one of the things you might be thinking about is the consequences of some of the technologies developed in this room. Because when you do this organ engineering and when you do synthetic cells and stuff, you can also do synthetic meats, cruelty-free beef, 380,000 bucks, 2013, not a lot of people eating synthetic hamburgers, 30 bucks, 2015, nine bucks, 2020. And as your cost curve comes down, even if you are a meat eater, it is not going to be acceptable to have killed a creature that was alive. And those pictures of you going to the steakhouse on date night are not going to look as cute. That is not going to be a good picture in 30 or 50 years. Same thing with the environment. We've been modifying the environment, putting up tons and tons of CO2. But what happens when you have cost curves that look like this? that makes solar and wind faster, better, cheaper than oil and gas and coal. When people have alternatives to this, how are they going to look in retrospect at what we did, having very different alternatives? And so what's okay today may be wrong tomorrow, and if you take the position, I know right and wrong, you allow no discussion, no tolerance, no evolution, no learning. I'm going to cancel you because you wore a costume. I'm going to cancel you because you have an opinion that's different from mine. I'm going to accuse you because you had a stupid tweet. And that's enough to ruin a career. And that makes these debates about what's right and wrong very difficult because they become very scary debates because we're not using two words. We're not using humility and forgiveness. These are words that are just banned from most campuses and most political debates. And so as you're thinking about this stuff, why should all of you care? Because a lot of you are driving this stuff. Because when you make synthetic organs, you can redesign synthetic organs and redesign their function and their longevity. When you program synthetic cells in a company that I co-founded, then you begin to make synthetic life forms. And those cellular platforms become and allow you to make synthetic living machines. And then another company we created allows you to have little desktop printers, just like laser printers, except that you can program cells, put in the sequence, and have the output in a living machine. As we go forward in this stuff, this is becoming scalable. And that has a whole series of consequences. 
you can begin to make biohybrid animals with rat heart cells, with rubber, with gold. You can begin to play with questions like what is life, as Jack Shostak and Dimitar Saslov are doing. Thinking of taking the inorganic and making it something organic and creating life. Perhaps for the second time or perhaps for the millionth time or the billionth time. We'll find that out pretty soon again, thanks to the work of a lot of folks here. But these are absolutely fundamental questions, and we better discuss our notions of right and wrong with a little bit more humility, a little bit more forgiveness, and a little bit more caution that we are absolutely right and will always be so. Thank you very much. Juan, just one question. The notions of right and wrong, what's acceptable in society, over time kind of gets codified into rules and regulations and customs and so. Now it looks like many technologies and many scientific, scientific advances, advances have kind of reach escape velocity when confronted to this. So our capacity to codify them seems to have fallen apart. Uh, how do we deal with that? So part of the problem is it's accelerating and, and these things that your grandparents would have thought X, Y, or Z about sex are now being compressed into a five-year cycle where you can go from I'm not in favor of gay marriage to I'm in favor of gay marriage, which in the current Pope's case was three years from the letter to the Carmelites of this is a sin against God to who am I to judge? Three years, right? And, and when these things get compressed to this stage, the pressure on all of you who are inventing, the pressure on all of you who are discovering, the pressure on all of you who are changing the rules as you make stuff that's new makes you much more powerful than legislators in setting the initial rules. And that's why these debates about right and wrong can't be HR manuals. Oh, I've, I read the HR manual. I know what's right, I know what's wrong, and I know what to do. That's not where the rubber meets the road. It's in the inventions that change society, and then eventually the legislators are going to realize, oh my god, evolution might have happened, because we're still debating whether evolution happened in the United States. Right? So they're a little far behind in this stuff. And all of you have to think more carefully about huh, if I do this, what could I change? So the responsibility falls increasingly on the inventors. Yep. Juan, thank you very much. <laughs>